Thank you. Before we begin uh, business for this afternoon, there is something I wish to say. Uh, further to today's point of order FMQs, I would like to inform the Chamber that I acknowledge that Mr Gibson did not make the initial remark, which I found to be unacceptable. That was made by Mr Maxwell, uh, who has made a full apology. I have apologised to Mr Gibson for my misidentification. But I have made it clear to him that there were other ways he could have dealt with this rather than having a dialogue with me across the floor of the chamber. I now consider the matter closed. We now move to the first item of business this afternoon, which is a debate on motion number 10051 in the name of Fergus Ewing on Homecoming Scotland 2014. Members who wish to take part in the debate should press the request to speak button now. And can I advise members that the presiding officers will be generous in the time allowance this afternoon? I call on Fergus Ewing to speak to him of the motion. Minister, you've got 14 minutes or thereabouts. Uh, presiding officer, today's debate is an opportunity first to highlight how homecoming will extend the benefits and opportunities offered by the Commonwealth Games, the Ryder Cup, the MTV Europe Music Awards and the Armed Forces National Day event. Also to promote the year-long coordinated program of events designed to welcome visitors in a celebration of the very best of Scotland's food and drink, of our assets as a country of natural beauty and our rich creativity, cultural and ancestral heritage. And thirdly, to celebrate the significant successes already achieved to date. Scotland competes for each and every visitor. It's a global market and one which continues to grow. The number of overseas visitors to Scotland is forecast to rise faster than the UK average, with the recent independent Barclays study predicting spending to rise by 40% by 2017, contributing £2.5 billion to our economy. These are welcome predictions in respect of our visitors from overseas, but the industry also recognises that we have to keep refreshing the offering, and of course, we cannot afford to be complacent. We also need, presiding officer, to make sure that we recognise the value of not only our biggest market, but also our oldest friends, England. The latest figures for 2013 show that residents in England took 10% more short breaks in Scotland than in 2012, and that there was a 4% increase between 2012 and 2013 in residents in England taking longer holidays in Scotland, and very welcome each and every one uh, is. And in 2013, the media giant CNN named Scotland as their top travel choice for 2014, a view endorsed by Lonely Planet and Wanderlust, who identified Scotland as a top world tourist destination to visit in 2014. That's a tribute to the successful work of Visit Scotland and their team. Yes, of course. Jenny Mar I thank the uh, Minister for, for giving away, presiding officer. I, I may have misread the figures, but my reading of the figures in quarter four, uh, October to December 2013, is that domestic visits have decreased over 22% on, on the same quarter the previous year. Minister? Well, I, I, I think the, the most recent figures which have just been released uh, do show a very positive figure for tourism, particularly for overseas visitors. And uh, there has been, from time to time, a uh, reduction in domestic tourism. And that is taking place on both sides of the border, both in Scotland and in England. And I think that point is important to make. Uh, but let me return to the topic of the day, which is homecoming. And homecoming 2014 is the glue that binds together the unique opportunities of 2014. It builds on the successes of Homecoming 2009, which influenced more than 95,000 visitors to travel to Scotland, and it generated net additional expenditure of £53.7 million. A key feature of 2009 uh, was the strong partnerships developed to unite behind a common theme, and the Scottish Government committed to maintaining this approach by delivering a series of themed years running from 2010 to 13. This activity spotlighting some of our greatest assets brought focus to the promotion of domestic and international tourism 
and supported developments of the events industry in Scotland. And this has been a great success. Over half a million people attended events and activities celebrating the year of food and drink. We saw a, a 6% increase in participation levels at events supported throughout the year of Active Scotland. And the year of Creative Scotland messaging reached almost 70 million people. During the year of Natural Scotland, a 12% increase in the number of visitors to rural and coastal locations in Scotland was achieved. 2014 is a unique year for raising the profile of Scotland, both nationally and internationally, as a world-class tourism destination. At its heart is the homecoming programme, whose delivery is being led by Visit Scotland, along with private, public and third sector partners, and supported by a five and a half million pound core budget from the Scottish Government, Visit Scotland are targeting a return on investment of 44 million pounds additional tourism revenue for Scotland. Presenting officer, 837 events are now included, more than double the number in 2009, with activities taking place across every local authority area in Scotland throughout the year. I'm sure many members in this chamber will wish to extol and promote the events that are occurring in their areas and constituencies. Homecoming themed Hogman and Burn celebrations have already taken place. The legacy of John Muir was recently marked with the John Muir Festival, the opening of the John Muir Way, and of course the launch of the iconic Kelpies sculptures. Looking ahead, key events such as Bannockburn Live, the Edinburgh Festivals, the Fourth Bridges Festival, the Ryder Cup opening concert, the Highland Homecoming, and MTV Europe Music Awards have still to come. But as well as these, there are community-led events taking place the length and breadth of the country. My ministerial colleagues and I, uh, including Fiona Hislop beside me here, uh, are fully committed to actively supporting the range of events throughout the year. The efforts of the officials involved, presiding officer, have been unparalleled, and I'd like to pay tribute to their unstinting support and determination to make sure that Scotland succeeds as never before on the world stage. <laughs> Visit Scotland is leading the effort with partners to ensure that uh, Scotland's welcome to the world is promoted throughout the whole year. They've developed the Brilliant Moments on the Doorsteps campaigns to promote the 2014 events programmed to a UK-wide audience. And media and PR events in Visit Scotland's key markets have already secured an estimated reach of 6.5 million from international press advertising, and substantial news and travel coverage is contributing to the global PR reach. And results are already being achieved. Uh, Celtic Connection celebrated its most successful year to date with over 110,000 and gross ticket sales topping 1.15 million pounds, a 10% increase in previous years. Electric Glen, the Winter Lighting Festival in East Renfrewshire's Rook and Glen Park sold all of its 24,000 tickets this year, more than doubling last year's attendances. The Glasgow Film Festival was another fantastic success with record-breaking ticket sales in excess of 41,000, the highest in its history and up by 6% in last year. And 9,000 people, presenting officer, attended the spectacular international opening of the Kelpies, indicating the positive benefit likely to be realized for the local area. Uh, in addition, Visit Scotland and the enterprise companies are working with their account managed businesses to harness the potential of homecoming. Some notable successes already include Royal Mail, who have created a homecoming postmark, Thomas Tunnocks and Walker's Shortbread, who will feature the homecoming logo on product packaging, and Mackey's Crisps, who are running homecoming Scotland on pack promotions. Uh, Homecoming also offers the opportunity to maintain the momentum and the goodwill generated in 2009 amongst the millions of ancestral Scots. And this year sees a significant number of clan-focused events being supported by the Scottish Government. And I am delighted, presiding officer, to have the following message of support for Homecoming from Sir Malcolm McGregor, convener of the Standing Council of Scottish Chiefs, who is also in this chamber watching this debate today. And he has said this, the clans and their leaders play a significant role in attracting thousands of Scots living in other parts of the UK and abroad back to Scotland every year. Therefore, the Standing Council of Scottish Chiefs 
wholeheartedly support initiatives like Homecoming. A Homecoming year is particularly important because it gives the Worldwide Clan Network a sense of focus and purpose, combined with a significant anniversary like the Battle of Bannockburn, increases the resonance. Homecoming is about bringing people home, home to Scotland. Many of those who answer the call have strong clan and family roots from the Outer Hebrides to the borders. They take part in and contribute financially to clan-based conservation projects and communal activities. This, in turn, help to develop a sense of belonging and affection towards local communities within Scotland. I'm sure that we would all welcome that uh, strong message from Sir Malcolm. I've also been working closely with our Highland clans in support, supporting formation of a Highland clan partnership group. This work led to the launch of the Scottish Clan Event Fund, which is providing legally constituted clans and societies financial support for clan events held across Scotland. And I'm also delighted, presiding officer, that John Mackenzie, the Earl of Cromarty and chair of the Highland Clan Group, is here today as well to offer his support for the homecoming celebrations and who has also provided this message of support. On behalf of the Highland Clans Partnership Group, I would like to offer my support to Mr Ewing in the Homecoming Scotland 2014 initiative. With its focus on our ancestry, our heritage and culture, Homecoming Scotland 2014 has helped to promote and assist our clan societies to hold their own gatherings with an emphasis on attracting and enabling overseas clan members to come to Scotland in the years to come. Presiding officer, I think it is undoubtedly the case that the enormous work, effort and commitment that is made by the clans in arranging and delivering their gatherings, often on a quinquennial basis, brings people to Scotland for the purposes of friendship and amity. And it is difficult to, uh, uh, to overestimate the contribution that they make to Scotland and to tourism. Homecoming is also providing the opportunity to celebrate Scotland's diversity and is helping to ensure all of Scotland's communities are encouraged to join in the celebrations. Education Scotland, as part of their cross-curricular approach to education, have also developed a Homecoming 2014 learning resource that is helping teachers using Homecoming events as a context for learning to draw on available resources aligned to the themes of the year. Presenting officer, between now and the end of the year, over 570 Homecoming events are still to take place. We are halfway through the month-long celebration of whisky with events focusing on one of Scotland's biggest cultural exports as well as the very best of Scotland's food and drink. Bannockburn Live will be an inclusive event representing the best contemporary Scotland has to offer and also marking the 700th anniversary of the battle at Bannockburn. Over the summer, there will be a full range of homecoming activities complementary to the Commonwealth Games and the Ryder Cup will be a key focus of activity in the autumn, along with the Fourth Bridges Festival, the Highland Homecoming, and the MTV Europe Music Awards 2014. Homecoming will also be the springboard for a further series of themed years celebrating our world-renowned food and drink, our reputation of innovation, architecture, and design, our unique history, heritage, and archeology, span and the exceptional potential of our young people. Uh, in conclusion, a uh, presiding officer, homecoming is already proving to be a great success. Uh, I hope that we can all use this afternoon's debate to welcome the year, uh, that we can explore what the celebrations will mean at a national and local level, and working across all parties in this chamber in a bipartisan fashion, agree to work together to support Scotland's events industry and harness the current and emerging tourism and economic opportunities as we progress through this very exciting year and beyond. Thank you, Minister. I now call on Jenny Mara to speak to you and move amendment number 1005.1. Ms Mara, you've got 10 minutes or thereabouts. <laughs> Thank you, Presiding Officer. Um, can I start by uh, moving the Labour amendment in my name this afternoon? 
The 2014 year of homecoming is an opportunity to showcase Scotland to the world. But it is also an opportunity to create lasting change for Scotland's communities and our economy. And Labour's amendment to the government motion today highlights that opportunity. And I want to explore some ideas of how we can go about achieving that. The Commonwealth Games, which we are all uh, looking forward to, especially since uh, Mo Farah uh, announced that he was going to come and join us in Glasgow. The Commonwealth Games is one of the thousands of events taking place across Scotland to mark the year of homecoming this 2014. And I would like at this point to pay tribute to the, the sterling work of uh, Glasgow City Council and the, the Labour administrations there who have worked tirelessly over the year and are now working hand in hand with the Scottish Government to make that event a big success. Together with the Ryder Cup and events in every local authority area, Scotland is going to receive a significant economic boost from the number of people visiting our country in the latter half of this year, not only in the short term, but in the long term too. Barclays Bank has estimated, presiding officer, that spending from overseas visitors in Scotland will rise 40% by 2017. Similarly, Deloitte has estimated that the tourism industry, which was worth almost 12 billion, in 2013 will grow to be worth 23 billion by 2025, a rise of over 40%. In this sense, the homecoming will help secure long-term growth in Scotland's tourism, hospitality and service sectors. Coupled with infrastructure investment, the likes of the Victoria and Albert uh, Design Museum, which will be opening in my home city over the next few years, we have the opportunity to boost long-term growth in every part of Scotland, which is extremely important. Now, these estimates from Barclays and Deloitte are hugely optimistic and the plans and figures, and, and well, they should be. Tourism has got to be, I think the Minister and I have discussed this before, one of the industries of growth in our country. But these plans and figures are also instructive to the government about the opportunity we have to make the most of that potential for all our communities. At every turn, we should be asking how we create lasting change in our economy and in our communities, particularly those communities most in need from this predicted boost in the tourism industry and events like the 2014 homecoming. Take, for example, the provision of modern apprenticeships. In March last year, Skills Development Scotland produced an investment strategy for tourism. In that strategy, it worked with tourism employers, stakeholders and partners to identify skills gaps in the sector and made a number of recommendations about how those skills gaps could be addressed. Now, chief among the comments from employers was that there is a need to improve young people's awareness of the careers opportunities in tourism and that there is a need to create clear and well-publicised routes into the tourism industry, and that there was a need to promote a skilled workforce, particularly in the management and professional categories. Presiding officer, this is um, a gap which I have experienced at, at first hand recently on visits to employment projects in Dundee. I was, um, I was a little surprised, but really heartened by the amount of uh, young, especially men in the room, who said that they wanted to work in the, the hospitality industry. And there is obviously appetite uh, for that. So I think these, um, these predicted growths is very good uh, for, these, for these young people. And we must uh, find ways of getting them into the industry and getting them skilled up so that they um, are very good employees in the industry, but are also creating businesses of their own and creating work for other people. The same report goes on to cite modern apprenticeships as a key lever in achieving these aims. Now, at the time of the report's publication, the Minister Fergus Ewing said, as we prepare the nation to welcome the world to Scotland in 2014, ensuring employers can access the training they need is more important than ever. 
and I agree. Yet I have been contacted recently by one training provider of modern apprenticeships in the areas related to tourism, such as hospitality, retail logistics and customer service, who have been told by Skills Development Scotland that funding in those sectors is set to be cut in the coming year and cut again in the years to follow. Now, this has naturally caused alarm in the company, who have made the very valid question to me that in this year of homecoming, why are we pulling investment out of the very sectors that are critical to its success against the advice of Skills Development Scotland's own investment strategy? Now, perhaps the Minister, in his closing remarks, could shed some light on that point, or perhaps we can discuss it after this debate, or perhaps even give me assurances that Skills Development Scotland funding for modern apprenticeships in these areas will not actually be cut in light of the huge growth potential that he and both I have outlined today. Now, presiding officer, the, the government motion mentions attracting overseas visitors to Scotland, and this is hugely important, not just because the tourism it brings in, but because of the potential to build business links in emerging markets and the social good that comes from having a diverse and culturally rich society. However, one of our biggest tourist markets is on our doorstep in the form of the rest of the United Kingdom. And if we look to visit Scotland's tourist figures for the last quarter of 2013, just published the other day, we find something quite surprising. Now, while the number of overseas visitors has increased by 20%, domestic tourism within the United Kingdom to Scotland has dropped by 22% and spending in that sector went down by 10% too. Now, presiding officer, there are certain intangibles that contribute to a successful tourism sector. Factors, I think, that are hard to measure, but I think influence a person's decision to visit a particular country. And one of those intangibles is goodwill between countries. And it is a well-known fact among tourism experts and a sensible assertion that when countries foster goodwill towards one another, it will help boost tourism between those countries. And I wonder, presiding officer, if the Scottish Government's position to break away from the rest of the United Kingdom and the message that that sends out to the people of England, Wales and Northern Ireland. Absolutely. Annabel Ewing. Intervention. Thank you. Um, I, I just wonder how what she says, which really is quite extraordinary of all the many extraordinary things you hear in this place, how that kind of works uh, with, for example, the Lonely Planets Guide Best Travel in 2014, where Scotland has been named the third best country to visit in 2014 behind only Brazil and Antarctica. How, how does this work in this member's mind that for some reason, just because politically we're having a debate, that people are not wanting to come to Scotland? Lots of people are coming and want to continue to come to Scotland and they are almost welcome. I thank, I thank Annabel Ewing for her intervention and like her, I always promote Scotland as the best place in the world to visit. But I always know that when the SNP start reading from pre-prepared briefs that it is, is um, to counter the facts that have... It is to counter the facts that have been published by their agencies because Visit Scotland have published these figures. On the 8th of May 2014 at 9.30 hours. And it makes. We let the member makes, make her point, shall we? It makes very clear that overseas visits to Scotland have increased, overseas spend has increased, domestic visits for full year and for quarters have decreased. And for quarter four, October to December 2013, domestic visitors from the U United Kingdom into Scotland, domestic visits have decreased by 22.5%. Yes, happy to take the intervention. Dennis Robertson. I thank the member very much for taking the intervention. The member perhaps accept that in this uh, time of austerity, people are perhaps maybe looking at how they spend their money. And it's nothing to do with goodwill. We send our goodwill and good wishes to all our neighbours, not just within the UK, but within Europe and the globe. Jenny Mara. Officer, I, would, I would ask Dennis Robertson to study carefully 
the, uh, the figures from Visit Scotland and see if he does not come to the same conclusion that I do. But I would be very interested to hear the Minister's explanation for that quarterly drop in his closing remarks. To sum up, Presiding Officer, if I may, the year of homecoming Scotland is an opportunity for us to celebrate all that is great about our nation. However, it also presents us with a chance to create lasting economic and social change in communities throughout our country. We have to seize that opportunity wherever we can, and I hope that we see long-term economic benefits and a positive social legacy from the events that will take place this year. Hey, thanks. And I now call on Alex Johnston, a generous six minutes. <laughs> Thank you for your generosity, Deputy Presiding Officer. I, I rise to support the motion in the name of Fergus Ewan, uh, and we will also support the amendment uh, in the name of Jenny Mara. We have already heard at some length uh, during the course of this debate uh, that about the importance of the tourism industry in Scotland. Certainly, there are areas like this here in Edinburgh for whom tourism is an extremely important industry and has been for many, many years. Uh, I notice some members representing Edinburgh have taken it upon themselves to give me some encouragement when I mentioned that. However, one of the problems we face is that it can be difficult to get uh, tourists coming to Scotland to move around the country and to go to other areas. Those who are familiar with the nature of the rural economy will realise that, surprisingly perhaps, tourism is right up there as one of the most significant contributors to the rural economy. However, there is so much more we could do if we can get people to go out and visit rural areas of Scotland and the more far-flung areas such as the Highlands and the Islands. We do, of course, realise that uh, it is important, as the Minister said in his opening remarks, that we encourage and foster good relations with our United Kingdom partners. Uh, somewhat controversially, the subject has also been raised by Jenny Mara. But on that subject specifically, I do believe good-natured good uh, friendship is very important in driving that forward. And I think there are some very interesting figures that can be uh, obtained on the number of German tourists who have visited southern Europe in the last two to three years. At the height of the crisis over the euro, when there was a, a view in certain southern European countries that Germany was uh, reeling in some of the loans and the, putting financial pressure on them, many Germans found it difficult to visit these countries because they believed they were unwelcome. For that reason, I think it's important that we all have that clearly in mind, and whether you're for or against the arguments that have been put during the course of this debate so far, uh, I think uh, I am glad to have heard Fergus Ewan himself raise this at the start of the debate as one of his priorities. But Scotland is a popular tourist destination. We've heard about the CNN, Lonely Planet and Wanderlust assessments that Scotland was one of the best places to visit. Uh, and I couldn't agree more. Scotland is a wonderful place to live and it is a hospitable place which attracts visitors from all over the world. It is, of course, important that we concentrate on ensuring that our North American tourist trade and our international tourist trade from other countries continues to thrive because American visitors, above all, have a very high spend rate when they come to Scotland and can be very important to many of our tourist businesses. That's why Homecoming Scotland 2014 is such a significant part of the effort that's going on all over the country to ensure that we can deliver that. Now, looking at the events that are taking place this year, Scotland has been quite courageous in taking forward some of the opportunities. When you see events like World Cups and Olympic Games almost driving quite large countries with large economies to the verge of bankruptcy, it is a significant year for Scotland that the Commonwealth Games and the Ryder Cup are going to be staged here in the same year. For that reason, it is a demonstration of Scotland's ability that it can successfully organise such events and do so in such a practical and effective manner. I think we should be proud of our achievements. The Commonwealth Games facilities are ready and the Ryder Cup itself uh, will, I'm sure, be a success although it will be difficult to find ways uh, to outperform the way the Ryder Cup will, I'm sure, promote the sales of tartan trousers, as it has in previous years. The MTV Europe Music Awards will 
uh, pass without making any dent in my diary, I'm sure. Uh, however, Armed Forces Day is a, a key event uh, and one which all of us should support, uh, commemorating the e extremely uh, effective military history yeah. of Scottish regiments and their role within the British Army. Yeah. When we look at the Homecoming Scotland programme, uh, there are one or two things I have to take the Minister up on. Uh, Whiskey Month in particular gives me a serious cause for concern. I believe it is impossible to do justice to our whisky industry in a single month, uh, and I think consideration should be given to extending that, uh, if not officially, then certainly in an unofficial capacity, and I'm willing to join the Minister in doing all I can to that end. Uh, Bannockburn Live uh, will be an interesting one. Of course, it's built around an event which uh, happens uh, on an annual basis. And I noticed that there have been significant changes to the financing of that event, perhaps something which uh, is being learned from previous experience. I've uh, publicly expressed my concern that the fourth Bridges Festival is perhaps going to happen rather too close to the referendum uh, and may, uh, I worry, uh, be lost in the publicity surrounding other things at the time. The Highland Homecoming also will be significant. And over 800 events mentioned in the, the government motion uh, will, of course, uh, be taking place around Scotland, something we should all be proud of. However, we should learn the lessons of the past. The issues surrounding the gathering in 2009 are still with us. That flagship event uh, of 2009 did, of course, run into financial problems. The company running the event lost £516,000 and went into liquidation, with £382,000 owed to six bodies and a further £344,000 owed to 103 private organisations. The Scottish ministers had to help rescue the 2009 event with a £180,000 interest-free loan, uh, which was not disclosed at the time, if I remember correctly. Audit Scotland reviewed the event and had uh, some scathing recommendations around improving communication, better financial reporting and greater accountability. The Public Audit Committee also reviewed the procedures around the event, concluding that poor communication at key points throughout the planning, delivery uh, and aftermath of the Gathering 2009 event meant that sometimes decisions were taken without access to all the available information. The Scottish Government should have told the steering group about the £180,000 loan to the private sector company delivering the event. We also, they also recommended that it reconsider its approach of joining any such steering groups in future. Lessons which I hope will be learned for the purpose of the event which is coming up. The fact is that the 2014 event is a landmark. Uh, uh, yes, indeed. Crawford. Except in terms of the Bannockburn Alive event, it's structured in a completely different way. It's been run in a completely different way. It's an entirely different type of event. Alex Johnson. And that may have been partially due to the, uh, the understanding that was accrued after the 2009 event, where, le where lessons are learned. The, the 2000, 2014 is a landmark year of cultural and sporting events in Scotland, which present us with an opportunity not only to showcase the many positive aspects of Scotland to the world, but also to reach out to the diaspora and our trading partners, both old and new, to maximise the cultural and economic benefit of this eclectic programme. There really is something for everyone this year, and I very much welcome the fact that these events are not occurring in the restricted geographical area of the Central Belt, but will also get some benefit to the Highlands and, uh, islands and the North East. It's regrettable that uh, uh, the perception of the homecoming has been somewhat tainted by previous issues. However, I am confident that uh, public opinion will get behind this. With these concerns in mind, however, I hope that the Minister is not only providing all the assistance required, but is also keeping a close eye on the event planning, although it is heartening that premium tickets for the Bannockburn event and pitches uh, for, the clan, for the clans are sold out already. Delivering a successful event and indeed a positive experience for our visitors is vital if we want to see them 
either return to further explore our magnificent landscape, our enviable history uh, and our culinary excellence, which can be found across Scotland, most often using the world-leading produce that we have in Scotland. 2014 is an opportunity. It's one which I support and it's one which I hope learning the lessons of the past will lead on to a successful event. Many thanks. And uh, before I call uh, Christine Graham, uh, I just draw to the Chamber's attention that we have quite a bit of time in hand this afternoon at the moment, and members may welcome interventions and develop their points within reason, of course. Christine Graham, to be followed by Hans Alan Malik. It's extra time and I don't need to use it. It's the story of my life. Anyway, Deputy President, Office, I thought this was a debate about homecoming, uh, not about the wearisome, tedious scaremongering introduced by Jenny Mara. It wasn't even in your amendment. Uh, you know, where its places is not in this debate. First of all, I don't know who came up with the title homecoming as a marketing brand. I usually find these marketing titles miss the mark. But I like that one. Because you're coming home. It's evocative, it's warm, it's a good title. It encapsulates the journey from far-flung shores to journeying just from other parts of Scotland, or indeed England, to the community you've left behind. They're still deep in your heart, these communities. So it's touching on something that we all have within us. Now, we know that the Scottish population is around 5.2 million, but you can multiply that tenfold, at least, for those with Scottish ancestry and connections. And we all know the importance of tourism, domestic and otherwise, to the Scottish economy, illustrated by the statistics in the Minister's speech. Yes? Stuart Stevenson. Um, the member, of course, is correct to talk about the importance of uh, domestic tourism. Uh, will she note that Visit England report a 21% drop in domestic tourism in England? Uh, with a continuous decline there. So whatever patterns may be uh, prevailing in uh, domestic tourism, Scotland is doing neither better nor worse than anywhere else. Christine Graham. I'm obliged to the member for that. I know that Jenny Mara was busy writing that down and amending her summary at the end as she's doing the reply. From my perspective, I found the website on Visit Scotland and read the website of Scottish Borders Council regarding homecoming events easy to access, and I am a technophobe. If I can understand it, anybody can understand it. However, I think Midlothian Council has missed a bit of a trick. I tried to use their website to see what was going on there. It wasn't very good, except when they mentioned the Midlothian Science Festival in October, part of the events of homecoming. So I say to Midlothian Council, sort out your website, there's still time. Because as we all know, and no doubt some of us, and I will, refer to events in our own constituency, there's a lot going on out there beyond the conurbations. And the difficulty was making sure homecoming Scotland went beyond the big cities and going on beyond the official, in inverted commas, homecoming events small things happening which could piggyback on the official stuff. Now, my political patch straddles parts of the borders in the south of Midlothian. It goes from Melrose right across to the Pentland Hills. I love it to bits. But it's not, these two bits are not so different from each other as some might think. They both had a heritage of industry in textiles and in mining, now gone, and what they've left behind are historic events and historic museums. These are particularly accessible to English visitors who enjoy them very much, just as Scottish people enjoy travelling that one mile over the border into Berwick. The borders, it's... Yes? Ms Robertson. Uh, I thank the member for taking the intervention. The member uh, also acknowledged that it's not just open to uh, people, it's open to people and their pets quite often to enjoy the, the events that are taking place. It is indeed, and I'm obliged to uh, Mr Q's owner for bringing that matter into it. seems to be a bit of a star this week. The Borders is renowned, and rightly so, for its ridings, which do form part of the um, official events in return to the ridings. I know my diary is already filling up with galas, brawlad and lass, the Whitman of West Linton and Beltane at Peebles. These are extremely important to the communities. Melrose has had the Melrose Sevens part of the homecoming, 
but it has its book festival. The Abbey, now the Abbey, extraordinary place because it's said to hold the heart of Robert the Bruce and quite differently, it's got a sculpture of a pig playing a bagpipe. Why? Nobody knows. It also has that thing in Melrose that we've lost to so many of our wee places. It has little idiosyncratic shops. It's a wonderful place to go. We've got Abbotsford House that's just been refurbished, home of Sir Walter Scott and a spanky new visitor centre. And it's a real lesson in how to do a visitor centre. It's interactive, it's interesting. Children from the borders with their borders accents reciting Walter Scott's poems. It's excellent. In Midlothian, I mentioned the hunter lad and his lass at Pennycook. And of course, across the south of Scotland, what happens at these ridings and galas is that all the main players in the colours of their community with the rosettes go round all the ridings and galas in support of each other. It's a great community event, brings communities together across the south. Newton Grange, with that giant flywheel on Main Street, which used to haul the miners' cages down, up, up and down the pits, and the walkway, which actually grows across the A7, where the miners used to cross from the pits to the bathhouses to scrub off the pit grime. There's lots of things to see and do in Scotland. So people travel from outside across Scotland back to their home communities for these events to touch a little bit of their past. Each has their own individual homecoming, but they bring with them their wallets and their purses and they spend locally. They support the local business. And I'm pleased that the Minister has advised us an increase in rural visits because that's where we need to make our mark. We've got enough about Edinburgh and Glasgow and places like that. My teeny whinge is that the Borders Railway, the Waverley Line, will not open until early 2015. That links all these communities. It itself would have been a wonderful tourist asset. But what we do have is a link through the passing of the baton for the Commonwealth Games. On the 16th of June, it's going through Pennycook, Newton Grange and Gorebridge. And on the 18th, Elston, Melrose and Tweedbank, then on to John Lamont's uh, constituency. I don't care about that. But the point I'm making is it's uniting people who can't be maybe part of the Commonwealth Games, who may not even get those tickets, but they are involved in the whole good spirit. This is all good for local communities, and I congratulate the baton bearers and local businesses, which is just also good for the soul. I therefore wholly subscribe to the tenor of the motion, though I do wish, Minister, you had a wee word in it about the south of Scotland. We've not, I've messaged, not a bit in there about phrase mentioning the borders or the police in Galloway. We could have done with that. And I want to finally go back to Jenny Mara. You see, I'm half English. Half my relatives live in the Midlands. I've got a son marrying a Londoner in September. They're not going to stop and fall out with Scotland if we become independent. They're, in, they're on our side, actually. And my mother, English born, bred as I was, she was the biggest fighter for Scottish independence you ever met. So never forget, there's lots of English people on the side of Scotland's independence, and it'll be good for England. Many thanks. Answers on a postcard to Miss Graham as to why a pig might be playing the bagpipes in Melrose. Now call on Hanzala Malik to be followed by Bruce Crawford. Thank you very much and good afternoon, Presiding Officer. What is homecoming? Who is it for? And is it fit for purpose? When homecoming was launched, I thought this was a great idea. Labour launched homecoming Scotland successfully in 2009 creating jobs and adding to our economy. Scotland is doing well in some areas to build on this success. We are making a lot of effort in marketing Scotland's image overseas. It feels we are not really bothered at home. When I ask my constituents how they feel about homecoming 2014, the answer was, what's that? That in itself speaks volumes. Um, I feel that not enough is being done here at home. It is a bit of a cheek for the motion to talk about more than 800 funded and partner events when less than 15% of homecoming events this year are brand new. This means around 700 of the events would have happened anyway. 
being promoted anyway by, for example, Glasgow City Marketing and other such organizations. This has left me unimpressed. It tells me that much more can be done. This is supposed to be a year for Scotland to reinforce its position on the international stage as a dynamic and a creative nation in 2014. Scotland will be on the world stage as never before, yet Scotland is being unoriginal and is not fulfilling its capabilities on opportunities that brings this year. This is a good level of success for, this, for individual events in Scotland this year already. Celtic Connection, Relic Cup, the Edinburgh Festival, the Commonwealth Games are only a few of the already successful brands that are included in Homecoming 2014. I feel a little, I find it, I find a little, I find little evidence that Homecoming 2014 is adding more value to many of these events. This is why I feel it should pay attention to newer events. Homecoming 2014 cannot have the brass neck and take credit for all the Scottish events in 2014. It can only take credit for the events that it has a role in. Of course I will. Mackenzie. Mr Malik, I'm sure, will recall, presiding officer, that he was in the Economy, Energy and Tourism Committee at the time when Visit Scotland outlined their plans for Homecoming Scotland and when, when they told us about the robust methodology that they use to um, determine whether or not they make a difference and that they indicated then there was a seven to one leverage, seven pounds, one for Scotland for every one pound that they spend of public money. Does Mr Malik not agree with me that that's a terrific result? Anzala Malik. I think that evidence at best is a little shady. And at, at worst, I think that uh, when organizations claim credit for work that they've not done or have done little to contribute to work that's being done is unfair and unreasonable to take credit from others. And this is why I don't agree with the member. However, going back to my points that I was making, that in addition, this is why I feel we should be attending to new events. Homecoming 2014 cannot have the brass neck of claiming credit for other organizations. It should only take credit for what it does. One of the events that Homecoming 2014 has had a role is in exhibition of the Battle of Bannerburn sales. For Bannerburn currently stands at a quarter of their allocation, according to Event Scotland. Is this okay? You will be the judge of that. But once again, shows more needs to be done in order to fulfill and capitalize on the proposed of Homecoming 2014. According to its website, is for welcoming international visitors, 33% of sales of Manakban have been to overseas visitors and 18% of total sales have been to the US, which is reasonable. I do not want to come across as being against homecoming 2014. I just feel that m more can and should be done. Credit can only be claimed where credit is actually earned. And finally, presiding officer, I wish to say that I've, I also feel that Homecoming 2014 have failed to engage with the minority communities, a big opportunity missed, because one, it would have allowed people to engage and gain employment, and secondly, which is even more important, it would have brought communities together. I think that uh, Homecoming 2014 has been lacking in vision and in flair. I think that uh, this charge is a fair one, because I absolutely do not see any evidence in the minority communities of their work. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Now, Colin Bruce Crawford to be followed by Mike McKenzie. Well, as the constituency MSP for Stirling, I am delighted to have the opportunity to contribute to today's debate on Homecoming 2014. And frankly, I can't stand any more than miserableness this afternoon, because this should be about celebrating what we're trying to achieve in Scotland. 
talking up these events, trying to drive our economy, get more people involved, get a lot more tourists into our country and get this economy moving, not trying to talk everything down. But, you know, one thing I'm pleased about is that Stirling is at the very heart of the homecoming for 2014, just as it's at the very heart of Scotland. And this year, of course, we'll see the 700th anniversary of the Battle of Bannockburn and King Robert the Bruce's victory over King Edward II. And in recognising this very special year in Scottish history, the Scottish Government's invested, along with others, in a very new and exciting National Trust Bannockburn Visitor Centre, a centre that's already becoming legendary in its own right, with its special uh, state-of-the-art digital technology, incredible 3D effects. It brings to life the characters involved in the Battle of Bannockburn, nobles and commoners from both sides of the battle alike. Um, I've been involved in a, a couple of the, the battle plans that they, they, you can involve yourself in there. And once you see the scale of what Robert the Bruce was trying to deal with on in these days in 1314, you begin to understand the true genius of the guy as a commander of forces, whichever side of the argument you came on. I actually fought on King Edward's side and won. And that made me understand, even more importantly, uh, how difficult it had been for Robert the Bruce in his time. Um, the renovation work on the rotunda uh, and the magnificent equestrian statue of King Robert the Bruce uh, on the field of Bannockburn is truly remarkable. Some of the detail on that equestrian statue, uh, if anyone gets the chance to see it, is absolutely stunning. And I was delighted to be there on the day um, earlier on this year um, when Lord Elgin came along to unveil the statue of his ancestor. And I, th I think it has done the city of Stirling proud and those who are involved proud. Surely. Christine Graham. Can I say you've sold your visitor centre to me, so I'll come and see yours if you'll come and see mine. Uh, calmly, Mr Crawford. I can't remember the number of times I've been made that promise by Christine Graham, actually. <coughs> but we'll talk about that later, Christine. <laughs> Uh, the investment in that centre is already paying off, though, with reports in last week's media um, that there have already been 12,000 people through its doors um, since its opening only a few short weeks ago, and we haven't actually had the official opening of the place itself. Uh, so I want to congratulate the National Trust for Scotland. I know it's not been the easiest time for them in bringing it all together, and there are big challenges for them, but I think they've done a fantastic job on the ground of producing what is a fantastic visitor centre. Now, it goes without saying, of course, that there will be significant economic benefits to Stirling from the wider programme of homecoming events in and around the city this year. Uh, the 2014 homecoming year was kicked off early and in style by uh, Stirling's Hogmanay party at Stirling Castle, headlined by Deacon Blue. It was watched by over 1.3 million viewers, live TV viewers, um, last year alone. You know, money cannot buy that type of exposure, either for Stirling or indeed for Scotland. And the economic benefit calculations that were done both for the Stirling city and the wider Scottish economy were quite significant. Now, there are other outstanding events adding to the superbly diverse offer in Stirling in 2014. I'm sorry I'm going about Stirling all the time, um, Christine Graham. I've not yet mentioned the borders, but I now have, so I'm probably <laughs> off, the, off the leash. Um, so back to Stirling, as Alec Johnson quite <laughs> rightly said. One particular event I bitterly regret not being able to attend last weekend because I had a very heavy cold was the Spirit of Stirling Whiskey Festival. It is a whiskey festival that has grown in strength year in, year out. They've had to move to, to, to accommodate their, their growth and they've always had a sellout um, production. So I congratulate also the people involved in organising that. But it's fair to say... Certainly. Thank you, Dennis Dennis. Robertson. Uh, I, I appreciate the member had a heavy cold. Is the member not aware of the, the great Scottish toddy, which may have actually assisted with your cold? You're now teasing me, sir. Mr, <laughs> Mr Crawford. Because I'm going to have to admit something about how I sort my colds out. Um, not only do I have a lemsip, but I have a large glass of uskaba on top of that lemsip to help me get through the worst of it. So it's probably why I'm here today. It's fair to say, though, uh, over the weekend of the 27th and the 29th of June, June we'll see Stirling 
as the centrepiece of national events on an unprecedented scale. Pipefest, the National Armed Forces Day, Planet Dunn live event are three phenomenal events in their own right and could easily stand alone, but will combine in Stirling to create a truly remarkable weekend. So we'll have the skirtle of the drums and the boom of the, the skirtle of the pipes, I should say, and the boom of the drums. And talking of pipes, we have a piper now wanting to make an intervention. Stuart uh, McMillan. Uh, thank you. I'm, I'm grateful to my colleague, uh, Bruce Scoffer, for taking this intervention. But I hope he'll retract that comment about the pipes, because a skirtle is a bad note. It's not a good note. Oh. <coughs> well, all Robert. I can see is I've heard you playing. <laughs> <laughs> But at Pipe Fest, we'll see 1,600 pipers and drummers accompanied by Highland dancers, clan representatives, marching through the city on the Friday evening. And that will ensure without, beyond any shadow of a doubt that that weekend will begin in spectacular fashion. And no one will be in any doubt um, that there's an extraordinary weekend to be begun. Now, obviously, on that same weekend, we'll have the National Armed Forces Day event that will take place beneath Stirling's towering Castle Rock. And Stirling has a long and distinguished relationship with Armed Forces, and I'm therefore delighted with the City will host Armed Forces Day National event and continue with that proud tradition. But the Bannock Banner Live event itself will take place on the 28th and 29th of June. That will be a unique opportunity to celebrate Scotland's history and culture. So what's on offer? A stellar lineup of the best Scottish folk and contemporary music talented people that will keep the crowds entertained in the music arena of the Bannockburn Live celebrations. Headlined by singer-songwriters Doogie McLean and the Gaelic singing sensation Julie Fowlis. Three electrifying performances of the Battle of Bannockburn with hundreds, hundreds of reenactors from across Europe who will join forces and collide. All choreographed by Clan, Clan Ranald, who are famous for their work on Hollywood blockbusters, blockbusters, Gladiator, Robin Hood and Thor too. 300 living historians preparing for the battle. And you can experience life in 14th century Scotland at the interactive med medieval encampments, reliving the sights and sounds of the time, from the clang of the hammer to the aromas of the fresh kiln-fired bread. And you will be able to hear about the Scotland's culture and history, interpreted and retold in a range of prolific Scottish voices, as well as get a chance to be involved in Scotland's land of food and drink with one of the best natural larders in the world. And so at Bannockburn Live, you'll have many outlets where you'll be able to sample and savour delicious, delicious Scottish produce, Alec whiskies. so I hope you're buying your ticket, real ales and much more, as well as much meet, much the, the, meet the passionate producers behind them. And I want to personally thank uh, Dr Mike Cantley, Unique Events and uh, the National Trust for bringing together this event. I now understand that the tickets are well over 4,000 being sold. Things are progressing properly. There's a good plan in place to make sure the rest are sold. So Alec Johnson's already explained how we've, we've seen all the King's tickets sold. Thankfully, I've got my King's ticket for the Sunday because on the Saturday, I'll be at the, 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 the Armed Forces event. So Stirling and the surrounding area will also play host to an amazing array of other events. Um, from Stirling's Big Day Out, an international uh, angling festival, and obviously the wonderful events going on at the Smith Art and Gallery and Museum, and lots of other local events going on. Presiding officer, in conclusion, setting that alongside the world-class events being hosted in Scotland in 2014, including the Glasgow Commonwealth Games and the Ryder Cup, this truly is a magnificent year of culture for Scotland, with Stirling rightly at its very heart. And let's, for goodness sake, start talking up events in Scotland from now on in. Let's talk up our country and not talk it down. Make sure we get the tourists coming here, enjoying our product, and get on and get the job done. Many thanks for that spirited contribution. Now call on Mike McKenzie to be followed by Siobhan McMahon. Thank you, uh, President Officer. I'd like to congratulate uh, Bruce Crawford on a speech which actually managed to cheer Mr Malik up. I know that because I saw him smiling. And one of the issues, though, that, we, um, that was mentioned uh, during the Economy, Energy and Tourism Committee's scrutiny of homecoming was that there would be a displacement effect resulting from the large and higher profile events in the Central Belt, drawing people away from other parts of the country. And these concerns were given some credence because there is evidence from last summer suggesting that the Olympic Games had this effect. I was therefore delighted to hear 
uh, that Visit Scotland were aware of this potential problem and that they planned a very comprehensive programme of events covering <coughs> every part of Scotland. I am particularly pleased that even the far-flung communities of Orkney and Shetland have not been left out. And as Liam MacArthur would tell you, I am sure if he was here, Orkney's St Magnus Festival and Orkney International Science Festival are well-established, hugely stimulating and exciting events which will be giving a welcome boost by homecoming. More, more intriguing, perhaps, is the Orkney Nature Festival, billed as the outdoor Orkney Festival presenting Orkney Whiskey's wild side. Um, perhaps uh, um, Mr Johnson might care to, to travel to Orkney and take that in. Um, I would take the opportunity also, President Officer, of commending Highland Park to members, as well as the less well-known Scapa, both whiskies that are best savoured in the convivial settings of Orkney. But like all whiskies, they travel extremely well, reaching every corner of the globe in perfect condition. I would urge members, therefore, to visit Orkney, take in some of these events, take home some Orkney whisky, and also take home some wonderful memories. President officer, there is always some friendly rivalry between our islands, and that is why I am glad to see that Shetland has not been outdone by Orkney in terms of its fair share of homecoming events. And as Tavis Scott would no doubt tell you if he was here, the Shetland Nature Festival is in its seventh year. It is another established event highlighting Shetland's marvellous natural heritage. And even as an islander myself, I am astonished at the array of wildlife that can be seen at close quarters on Shetland. And its geopark status highlights and helps us understand the profound influence that geology has had and continues to have on our communities. Striations of limestone running through the Shetland strata produce fertile soils in an otherwise inhospitable and infertile landscape, greatly enhancing farming. The, the numerous <coughs> narrow sea locks are those historically provided an accessible and relatively sheltered winter fishery and now provide locations for fish farms. Shetland provides a wonderful showcase for geology. The Shetland Fiddle Frenzy focuses on Shetland's now well-known traditional music culture, taken to the world by people like Ali Bain and Katrina MacDonald and others too numerous to mention. And Shetland Wool Week celebrates another great Shetland strength, their world-renowned traditional knitwear, lace and other textile crafts, all of which have seen a revival in recent years and have significant growth opportunities. But Shetland, with its oil fund, provides a lesson for the rest of Scotland, as it can be after independence. Having invested its wealth over the years in excellent infrastructure, and world-class community facilities. And more recently, as the need to diversify its economy has become apparent, it's becoming a must-see destination for tourism, with investment now being put into this and other growth sectors. So I would urge members to go and visit this windy island paradise and to surprise and enervate themselves with its raw vitality, its creativity, and its sense of purpose and possibility. I only have time to give a flavour of some of the homecoming events happening in Orkney and Shetland. They are both communities which respect and value their past, their environments and their historical heritage. But they are also communities embracing the future and who actively demonstrate that these aims are not incompatible, but in fact in knowledgeable and caring hands can complement each other and empower local economies. President Officer, I too would like to congratulate Visit Scotland for their excellent ex execution <coughs> of this whole and vast programme of events. In recent years, they have achieved a seven to one multiplier for every public pound they have spent. For homecoming, they have set a target of eight to one. 
I am sure they will achieve this, and I am pleased also to note that their economic cost-benefit methodology is robust, so we can be sure of these figures. In conclusion, though, I would say that even with this robust methodology, the economic benefit is not fully captured in the figures. The effects last for years afterwards in repeat business, in broadcasting the merits of Scotland worldwide, in winning business for Scotland, Scotland's businesses at home and abroad. I look forward to a successful homecoming year and to many, many more such years in future. Thanks very much. And I now call on Siobhan McMahon to be followed by Stuart Stevenson. Thank you, President Officer. I am pleased to be able to take part in this afternoon's debate on Homecoming Scotland 2014. 2014 is a unique year for many reasons and will live long in the memory of us all for one reason or another. I am very much looking forward to the many celebrations taking place over the next few months to recognise this unique year, not least my 30th birthday celebrations. However, I understand this won't be paramount in all your minds and that the Commonwealth Games and the Ryder Cup will be just two of the main events receiving more attention. It's a real shame that the Commonwealth Games ticket fiasco of this week has dominated the headlines. I have been thoroughly impressed with the way in which the organising committee have engaged with the public throughout the year and lead up to the Games, and I would hate for what has happened in recent days to overshadow this. However, questions still remain that have to be answered. I, like many people, joined the queue for tickets on Monday morning. As the Chamber will know, it was one lengthy queue. The website informed me that I would be served on a first-come, first-served basis. However, after over 24 hours in the queue, with very little movement, I was informed by other people that they had received tickets despite only being in the queue for three hours. I and others in my position would like to know why that was the case. There are many questions that remain unanswered, and I hope that the responses will be forthcoming. However, as I said, it should not overshadow the event itself, and I very much look forward to the Games in Glasgow and, of course, Motherwell later in the summer. As others have reflected, Homecoming Scotland 2014 will host 837 events over the year. I understand that 265 events have already taken place, including the opening of the Kelpies at the Helix Park in Falkirk. Now, whatever your views are on the Kelpies, what is true is that it certainly provides a talking point. Of course, that is only one of the many events taking place across central Scotland with the help of Visit Scotland in the coming months. This weekend, your adventure starts here. A festival of museums will run at Calendar House and Park in Falkirk. And on the 7th of June, Shots will again host their Highland Games. This event started in 1950 and it attracts more than 2,000 people and includes events such as Tossing the Cabre. If members haven't had a chance to experience this event yet, I recommend that they do. It's always enjoyable, no matter the weather conditions. Of course, those are the enjoyable social events that Homecoming Scotland brings with it, but there are also the economic benefits that a year-long event like this should bring to all communities across Scotland. I wonder how we will measure the success or otherwise of this year-long event. Will it be in the numbers being attracted to each individual event, both from home and abroad? Will it be in the number of successful events being held? Or will it be in the long-term job opportunities individuals will be afforded as part of the legacy? Of course, there will be many who say it is all of these and more, and I agree with that to a certain extent. However, I do think we will be missing a great opportunity if we don't use this homecoming Scotland for the economic benefit it could bring to individuals trying to secure employment in this current economic climate. As members may be aware, Homecoming Scotland 2009 gave us 1,500 full-time equivalent employment opportunities. That was a substantial number, but I hope that in the five years that have passed since then, we can have an increase in the number and that those employment opportunities are sustainable. I am sure that we all agree that tourism has a large role to play in job opportunities. We know that the food and drink industry is seen as a key economic growth area and that this industry is vital to the success of Homecoming Scotland 2014. However, it may surprise members to know that, according to the Audit Scotland report of March 2014 on modern apprenticeships, just over 1,000 apprenticeships were granted in that sector, which is less than those granted in the automotive sector or in the administration and related sector, which has not been identified as a key sector. I also understand from that report that those people who secure a hospitality or tourism apprenticeship are more likely to be doing so from a Level 2 point and not at Level 3. The reason that has been given for this is that employers consider that to be more appropriate for the job role. 
I understand that 60 per cent of apprentices in the hospitality sector are doing a level two apprenticeship. Given that historically hospitality has been a sector that has been dominated by the female population, I believe we need to be doing more to encourage employers to see the value in awarding higher level apprenticeships. We need to be challenging the gender stereotypes that happen in certain sectors of employment, and I believe the apprenticeship programme is the way to do that. Given that the Audit Scotland report states that female accounted for 43 per cent of apprenticeships, but only a third of the apprenticeship spending of £25.6 million, and given the facts that I have outlined with regards to the hospitality and tourism sector, a key growth sector for the Scottish economy, as highlighted by the Scottish Government, it is imperative that we use Homecoming Scotland 2014 as a driving force to challenge this anomaly and give us a legacy that we can all be proud of. Yes. Mike McKenzie. I uh, respect your, con your concern for um, the economy, for jobs and so on. Would you join me in welcoming the outstanding figures on employment that were published earlier this week, where Scotland is doing better than any other part of the UK. Sir William McMahon. I thank the member for that intervention. I don't know that I would use the outstanding words. I appreciate that it's better than it was, and I always appreciate improvements. However, given that I've just spoken about female employment opportunities, and given that those uh, weren't as good as the rest of the figures, I think more has to be done. So I I'm sure the member will agree on that also. Um, with regards to tourism more generally, the Bartlett's report, as the Minister mentioned earlier, was issued earlier this month and it showed that Scotland is in line for a tourism boom, with the number of overseas visitors rising faster than the rest of the UK. We must capitalise on this. The study predicted that spending by overseas visitors will rise by 40% by 2017 and that Scotland could earn a total of £2.3 billion a year just by overseas tourism alone. That said, I am deeply concerned that domestic tourism is down by 22.5% in the last quarter, and I really do believe that that should be addressed because we should be attracting people from our borders, as Ireland managed to do in their own homecoming success. I believe that in order to achieve the figures that have been spoken about in the Barclays report, we must begin to remove some of the barriers that are in place with regards to tourism in Scotland. I have previously spoken about this issue in the Chamber before. However, it is something that still remains. We cannot begin to take tourism seriously if we do not have an industry that is open for business when we need it and when we want it to be. Many of the attractions that people may visit, wish to visit across Scotland, but in particular in Lanarkshire, are not open beyond 5pm at night, meaning that many people who work during the day do not get to enjoy some of the events that are being showcased this year. I hope that that is something that can be challenged and addressed for the future events. As I said at the start of my speak, speech, I welcome the opportunity to participate in this afternoon's debate, and I look forward to the many events that are still to come to celebrate Homecoming Scotland 2014. Excellent. Many thanks. And I now call on Stuart Stevenson to be followed by Stuart McMillan. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Presiding Officer. And let me just start by congratulating uh, Visit Scotland on the 64-page uh, brochure that they've produced uh, for Homecoming uh, 2014. It's a very impressive and wide-ranging uh, document. Um, as we've heard, it's got some 837 uh, events in it. Uh, and as we've also heard, not all of these events have been organised by Visit Scotland. But of course, we shouldn't be surprised by that, because Visit Scotland are a marketing organisation who are marketing other people's activities, hotels, restaurants, uh, bed and breakfasts, and events. And I sort of think to myself, what is going on there is drawing together in one package a wide offering multiplies the effect. <laughs> And as a tourist who's visited more than a quarter of the world's countries on various occasions uh, over the last 50 years, I can think of examples. I mean, if you come to Edinburgh and you want to go to eat, you walk down Rose Street because there's lots and lots of restaurants. So having a density attracts. If I go to Amsterdam, I go to a court Leeds uh, des uh, Warstrat, which has got even more than Rose Street. There's uh, 40 different kinds of restaurants uh, off the laid supply. And I always go there uh, when I'm in Amsterdam. So that drawing together, as Visit Scotland very successfully do, is what creates the attraction uh, for our many visitors. Now, like many others, I'm sure in the Chamber, I have relatives all around the world. 
uh, my great-great-grandfather Archibald Stewart, who was born in Bannockburn um, in uh, 1778, uh, emigrated to Canada in 1853 after he was widowed and took most of his family there. And in an action of breathtakingly successful fecundity, I now have 500 living relatives in Canada and Australia, which stem from that migration uh, of my great-great-grandfather and his offspring. And, of course, these people come back to Scotland, and I encourage them uh, so to do. Each and every one of us has similar opportunities created by the wanderlust and fecundity of the Scots. I encourage you to make use of it. But in the modern world, of course, things have moved on a little bit. In 1870, uh, my great-great-grandfather received a letter from one of his offspring, uh, who was still in Bannockburn, uh, telling of the death uh, of uh, a family member. Now we have the electronic world, and this week alone, using Facebook, I have been communicating with uh, re living relatives of mine in Australia, in South Africa, in England, uh, and uh, Denmark as well. So the way we connect is different, and the immediacy of connection is different. And through that, I can tell you that Emma, who is the sister-in-law of one of my nieces, was one of those who drove up with four of our pals all the way from the south of England precisely to be there when the Kelpies were opened. So that's a little bit of domestic tourism, the Kelpies already being successful in my own family. Now that hardly illustrates the overall general point. I can't and I don't attempt to do that. But it shows that there is a draw associated with that. Yes, I certainly will. Jenny Mara. Agree with me that Emma has perhaps bucked the trend and perhaps these domestic visits would have decreased 25% if it had not been for her visit. Well, perhaps uh, let's have a little talk about international and domestic tourism. International tourism is based generally on relatively long lead times for booking. And therefore, the variations you get in international tourism will be rel comparatively modest and more long run. Domestic tourism, the average number of nights, for example, that a domestic tourist spends is under four. It is opportunistic and booked at short notice, highly influenced by weather. If the weather's not good, you done a book. Also influenced by a whole wide range of issues. But I go back to the point that I encourage a visit to the Visit England website where you'll find the graph for domestic tourism in England is basically pretty similar to that in Scotland. So there's something going on which I can't get to the bottom of, and I don't pretend I can, uh, that is not unique to Scotland, that is probably due to the fact that the weather wasn't very good in November and December. Uh, but I could, of course, be entirely wrong, and I'm happy to be corrected at a later uh, point. I'm uh, very encouraged by something uh, I don't think I've heard mentioned so far. Um, given my interest in genealogy, I've been studying that subject for over 50 years in my family and have uh, identified 4,365 relatives. I now have my family tree. We're getting uh, Who Do You Think You Are? The show is coming to Glasgow uh, in August. And that will draw people not just from other parts of the UK as domestic tourism, but international tourism, to meet experts in genealogy, because it's one of the great uh, links that there are. Uh, last year, uh, an unknown cousin of my wife appeared from New Zealand, carrying an outline family tree and spent two months going around Scotland, researching the graveyards of Scotland. Uh, so even things like graveyards are tourist attractions uh, for, uh, for people. Now, I have other connections to Bannockburn. My great-grandfather uh, was born there as well on the Stevenson side. Um, there's no records because he obviously managed to escape the, the parish uh, registration system. Uh, but he was born there. Difficult for me to track down. I can tell you that in 1841, there were 308 Stevensons living in Bannockburn, and I don't think they were all my relatives. 
uh, and over 100 Stuarts, which is the, uh, the other side of my family. And one of uh, his offspring uh, was responsible for Bruce and Wallace statues being either side of the entrance to Edinburgh Castle. He unveiled them in 1929. And these are tourist attractions uh, to this day. But let me move to a local example, if I'm permitted, uh, presiding officer. And that is the traditional boat festival in Port Soy in my constituency. Perhaps 20,000 people will go to that village of not much more than 1,000 people. And I can tell you from previous uh, visits, this is the 21st run this year, that people come from Australia, they come from South Africa, they come from America to Port Soy to that event. I'm deeply disappointed in the Minister's drafting of the motion today. It makes no reference to the Port Soy Traditional Boat Festival, a hugely important economic uh, event in the north of Scotland, and one which exhibits food and drink. And Glassock Distillery is just next door, so Bruce Crawford would be pleased. It's an absolutely wonderful event that you will see on television, that will be broadcast uh, around the world. And it's but one example that we could all uh, come up with, one way or another, uh, all around the world. I'll conclude, uh, presiding officer, by perhaps um, picking up on what Jenny Mara said earlier and quoting from Ludovic Kennedy's autobiography in relation to the relationship between Scotland and England. He said, independence, England would lose a surly lodger and gain a good neighbour. And I'm absolutely certain that's the case. Presiding officer. Many thanks. A vintage performance. Uh, Mr McMillan to be followed by Marco Biaggi. A generous six minutes. Thank you very much, uh, presiding officer. Uh, 2014 is the most exciting year in our history, as well as the political events that are taking place. We've already heard of the many other events that are going to, are going to be happening as well. The Commonwealth Games, the Ryder Cup, the MTV Europe Awards, John Muir Festival and the Armed Forces Day. Uh, there are also the, the huge amount of other events that, that will take place annually, which certainly helps our uh, tourism offering, whether that's uh, to the external market or the internal market. But one thing is for certain, though, presiding officer, and that is that the eyes of the world are actually upon Scotland this year. And Homecoming Scotland 2014 and the offering that has adds something even more so to the opportunity that Scotland's got. Now, for me, Homecoming Scotland 2014 is yet another excellent initiative. And it certainly will help our Scottish economy and our confidence in our nation's self-esteem. And I certainly want to add my congratulations uh, to everyone concerned in taking it forward. Uh, I'm a, a glass uh, half full type of person. Uh, and I know that uh, there are many others in the chamber who are of the same ilk. Uh, and I'm sure that, like me, if any of you had the misfortune to have listened to the radio this morning when the Commonwealth Games uh, ticketing situation was being discussed, then I'm sure your glass wouldn't have been half full, it would have been totally empty. It, it was absolutely dreadful. It was so negative and it was blown out of so much proportion. Clearly, there is an issue. But what an issue to have. A huge demand for tickets. Now, these are extra tickets. Uh, and they're so popular that the system couldn't cope. Now, I dare say that uh, if actually uh, tickets were left uh, after, uh, if the system didn't break down and tickets were left, that there would have been complaints that they were too expensive, they were too inaccessible, and what a waste of time and energy and money. So let's get this ticketing issue into perspective. It's about buying tickets. It's not a life or death situation. When we consider events that are happening elsewhere in Europe or worldwide, this is only a ticketing situation. And a wise man told me this morning, presiding officer, in the lift coming into the parliament, about putting events into perspective. And I agree with him. Uh, the Commonwealth Games will be a huge success. They are attracting people from across the globe, and many of them will be coming back to their ancestral home. So, in effect, the Commonwealth Games are actually going to be their homecoming. Now, let's support the Games, and let's not talk them down uh, before they've even started. Now, there are a few homecoming events that I am uh, particularly uh, looking forward to, some of which are taking place uh, on, the, on the River Clyde. Uh, and certainly one of them is that the homecoming muster and the Commonwealth Flotilla. 
Uh, as uh, you'll be aware, uh, presiding officer, I chair the, the Parliament's cross-party group on uh, recreational boating and marine tourism. And this event actually was discussed over a year ago uh, within in the CPG. And we certainly put our support behind it uh, and work started in earnest to make it happen. And I, I certainly want to put it on record today that my thanks and congr congratulations to everyone uh, and, uh, and all the organisations who have been involved in actually taking this event forward. And I'm sure that this event will be a huge success and one of the iconic events of the year. It will be, if you pardon the pun, a sea of colour. Uh, and it will certainly show off the Clyde for one of the offerings, one of the many offerings the Clyde actually has. So on Saturday, the 26th of July, get to the banks of the Clyde uh, to witness uh, a once-in-a-lifetime experience. It starts at the James Watt Dock in Greenock and it heads up to Glasgow. When you go onto the, the RYA Scotland website, you'll see the following uh, about uh, the flotilla. It's the largest flotilla in the Clyde's history. 250 boats, one mission, many journeys of adventure and exploration, and you can be part of it and make history. Now, I'm delighted that this event is a Homecoming Scotland 2014 event, and it certainly will bring uh, another uh, water-based activity to the Commonwealth Games. And a further event that's taking place is the Race to the Games in 2014. Once again, it's River Clyde based, and it starts at the James Watt Dock in Greenock. It's a sailing challenge for people with additional support needs. And this takes place on the 2nd of July. Uh, and also later in the year, there's the annual Scotland's Boat Show uh, taking place at Kit Marina. And it's taking place from the 10th to the 12th of October. Uh, and certainly I've been told of just that some of the, the new events that they're actually going to introduce this year. Uh, and I'm sure actually this will be, be bigger and better than before. Uh, and uh, I, I certainly i have been to it uh, and I'll, uh, I encourage everyone to go along to it. But there's also another event that's actually not water-based that, that I'm looking forward to. And that's, uh, uh, it's an event taking place at Finlayson, uh, the home of Clan Macmillan, so maybe I should declare an interest. Uh, it's the Braveheart versus Robin Hood event. Uh, it's aimed at children up to 12 years of age. But I'm sure that uh, those, uh, those of us who are above 12 will certainly enjoy it and get involved in it as well. And this takes place on the 6th of July. Now, setting off, these are just kind of some, of, uh, some of the events that are taking place uh, in the, the west of Scotland uh, area, and some of them are, some of them are obviously water-based events. But there are many more water-based activities that are taking place across, uh, across Scotland, and certainly in the west. And I think I mean, anyone who goes to Loch Lomond on any given day uh, will actually uh, always enjoy uh, the pleasure that you can get from it. Presenting officer, we, we've already heard uh, about the, the comments from uh, CNN, uh, Lonely Planet, uh, Rough Guide and TripAdvisor, uh, who have made hugely positive comments about Scotland. Now, certainly in terms of the Lonely Planet, I'll just I'll quote uh, the, the, uh, just only part of their comment. Um, they, they say that to, co to coincide with Glasgow hosting the, the 20th Commonwealth Games in the summer of 2014, the city has, a multi, has had a multi-million pounds facelift, new sports venues, improved transport links, and a regeneration of Glasgow Harbour. It's also the year of homecoming, a government initiative to welcome the Scottish diaspora back to the mother country by celebrating Scotland's heritage, food and drink. The phrase, there's something for everyone, applies. So I think that's hugely positive. It's a great opportunity. So certainly I, I would encourage Hanzala Malik to actually speak to his colleagues in Glasgow City Council because of his contribution earlier on, I think he needs to talk to them about what's actually happened in Glasgow to make sure that the Commonwealth Games actually will be a huge success. Uh, Presiding officer, uh, I'm conscious of time, but finally I just want to turn to Jenny Mara's uh, comments from earlier. Now, I too I was born in England, I was born in Barham Furness. I've got family and friends uh, who still stay down south, and I genuinely do not recognise the negativity about our friends uh, south of the border. In fact, I think the interest from our folk south of the border is the exact opposite. Any time I speak to my family and friends, uh, it's, it's, they want to know what's actually going on in Scotland. They want to know, obviously, in terms of the political debate, but also in terms of other things that are going on as well. And also, uh, on Sunday, I was, out, uh, I was out at the Gurek Highland Games and spoke to, there was two ladies who I spoke to from Lancashire. Uh, and these two ladies, that, that they've lived in Scotland now for some time. Uh, and uh, they're saying that the family is coming up uh, over the summertime. They're looking forward to coming up. Uh, but they said, actually, they're looking forward to voting yes in the referendum. Because for them, it will actually make England that bit better. And for them, it's going to make the, the people of Lancashire, it will hopefully make them a bit better off. Because it's going to force the politicians in that area to do that a bit more for their constituents. So I, I, I certainly hope, presiding officer, that this, this year, this year 2014, is a huge year for Scotland. 
the eyes, as I said earlier, the eyes of the world are upon us. Homecoming will deliver hugely for Scotland. And with over 800 plus events across the country, from large to small, from urban locations to the, to the rural locations, including the borders, uh, homecoming has something for everyone. It's got something for the whole nation. And I, I am convinced that it actually will help promote Scotland well beyond our shores uh, long after 2014. Thank you. Well done. Many, many thanks. Now call on Marco Biagi to be followed by Margaret McCulloch. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. Um, this great year of homecoming began in October, in fact, when Lonely Planet came out with those comments that have been mentioned already. Lonely Planet called us the third best country in the world to visit. Uh, interestingly, they also, alongside that article, had a list of the regions and areas within countries that were best to visit. Perhaps Lonely Planet have continued their reputation of always being ahead of the times and knowing what the next big thing is going to be, but I, for one, was grateful for that little inclusion alongside um, other independent countries and, indeed, Antarctica. Uh, but uh, this homecoming has really been a, a, a broad exercise in bringing together, yes, some things that have already been scheduled, that were already happening, that are always happening, and putting them together with a brand that can be marketed both domestically and internationally. You know, back in 2009 and the run-up to that, the criticism that came was that we were focusing too much on the domestic market and not bringing enough people from abroad. It seems like you, you can't win, but then sometimes that, that is the feeling you get in this chamber. If the 2009 uh, homecoming had 411 events, I was taken aback when Mike Cantley came to the EET committee and said, a way that summed up his attitude there, that we were at 827 and they were about to stop counting. The impression was we could have kept on going, but at some point they had to draw the line and say, this is homecoming. No wonder that the calls for funding have been massively oversubscribed. There's been reach through the Scottish Enterprise Network. And above all, the homecoming idea is such a, a, a neat way of packaging a country for the international market that we got the highest form of flattery. We got imitation from Ireland, who in 2011 announced that 2013 was going to be their year of the gathering. And they took our idea and they ran with it, as they so often do in tourism, and got a quarter of a million extra international visitors. But there were words that were said by a junior minister for tourism at that launch that I think we should all listen to here. He said, he pointed to his green tie and he stated, we all need to wear the green jersey now. Everybody in this chamber should be wearing the blue jersey on behalf of Scotland for homecoming to promote ourselves as a nation and as a destination. Now, I accidentally, uh, well, I didn't accidentally find myself in Ireland. I had planned to go to Ireland in 2013, and I was there in October, and then somebody came up to me with a survey, and having obviously knocked a few doors and tried to get people to speak, I made sure I did my duty to these people. I took the survey, and I did it, but I also did my duty uh, to Scotland as a competitor nation, and I ticked that the gathering had had no impact on my decision to go to Ireland, so I am not one of those 250,000. But bringing this back from Dublin to here, the, the spatial dimensions have been talked about, whether events are happening in Edinburgh or around Scotland. The, the homecoming including the borders, the homecoming search on Visit Scotland finds 56 events within two miles from here. I would point out that there's one thing where Edinburgh is not doing terribly well on. Of all the clan gatherings that are going on this year, there's only two in Edinburgh, Clan Strachan and Marjorie Bank, or March Bank, sorry. Uh, clan Biaggi, uh, last I checked, wasn't gathering anywhere, but I think that may be for another reason. Order, please. <laughs> I think the, the member who's uh, making a contribution for a sedentary position would note that, that my tartan is pink through and through. Uh, <laughs> the, <laughs> the, the, the gathering 2009 is also something that has had some cringing memories here that, that have echoed back to the, the footage of the, the people coming down the Royal Mile and, and everybody watching it and thinking, oh, 
Yes, of course. Stuart Stevenson. He, he may be interested to know that in the 1841 census there were no Biagis in Scotland whatsoever. Marco Biagi. Indeed, because in my first ancestor arrived and showed up in the 1891 census. So you're not the, the, the member in question is not the only one who has researched his family history. <laughs> The gathering, to go back to that point, had brought 47,000 visitors, £8.8 .8 million in contribution to Edinburgh, 38% of that from overseas. And for all that we may look at some of the more enthusiastic pronouncements of some of the Americans who came here, I don't think there's a constituency anywhere in the country, whether that might be in the borders or in Inverclyde or Stirling, that would say no to such a, 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 an event if it could be repeated. Edinburgh also has the, the great series of events. I would perhaps recommend to Bruce Crawford, who was ill for his own whisky event, that there is World Whisky Day uh, being held in Edinburgh. There's previously Scotland's History Festival, which I've participated in. The Edinburgh Fringe, the largest in the world of its kind, bar none, which I have participated in now three times. The Edinburgh Marathon, which I have participated in, but will not be participating in this year. Yes. I, I'm, I'm intrigued. What was your participation in the fringe? What were you doing? Through the chair, please. Marco Biaggi. I do believe the member should uh, consult with uh, the assistant to Jean Urquhart, who will be able to tell you all, but it involved a satirical news programme. Moving on, uh, the last thing I wanted to highlight was uh, the MTV Awards, just going slightly outside of Edinburgh, although there is an Edinburgh connection because in 2003, of course, the same awards were held here uh, in the city. And I looked at them and I thought, is this going to be a sign of getting old? Am I going to be completely dated by this? But no, I found that the winners in 2003 were Justin Timberlake, Beyonce, Christina Aguilera, people that not only are still around, but that I have heard of and even have some songs by. So that is a reassuring additional angle to me for homecoming. It has reassured me that I am not getting old. Which brings me to Siobhan McMahon, who will be celebrating her 30th this year, she has already said to the Chamber. And she tried to say this was a date that none of us would really be marking. But uh, Siobhan McMahon, a quick uh, Google search, found that uh, her birthday is in fact the 4th of July, which many people in Scotland will be celebrating, mainly Americans, but I do find it wonderfully ironic that that is Independence Day. <laughs> Thank you very much. I now call Margaret McCullough to be followed by Annabel Ewing. Thank you, President Officer. I want to begin my remarks today by paying tribute to all those who will be working to make sure that this homecoming year is a successful one for Scotland. The tourism, hospitality and cultural sectors all contribute to the growth of the Scottish economy. And this year, with the Commonwealth Games, the Ryder Cup, the MTV Europe Music Awards all coming to Scotland, those workers will play a crucial role in shaping the experience of our country that foreign visitors have. In fact, everyone a foreign visitor meets will mould and form that experience of Scotland, whether they realise it or not, from cab drivers to cashiers, police constables to passerbys. But it's the people at the front line in these growth industries who I want to draw the Parliament's attention to. It's those people working in our visitors' attractions and the hospitality sector whose customer service, language, management skills are key to the success of Scottish tourism, especially if we are to enjoy the benefits of repeat tourism. Yet, despite their importance to the economy, the Joseph Rowntree Foundation has found that in both the hotel and restaurant sector and the retail sector, the majority of employees earn less than £7 an hour. Together, these sectors account for almost half of all those earning less than £7 an hour. Ms McCulloch, could you stop for a moment? Mr Johnson? Mr Johnston? I'd be grateful if you could return to your seat, please. Margaret McCulloch. Thank you. Together, these sectors account for almost half of all those earning less than £7 an hour, and many of those low-paid workers will be women. Of course, it's important to stress that there is also mobility in these sectors, my background is in training and I trained people in retail and hospitality for years. I can tell you from experience that an entry level job in these sectors can and often does lead to further training, skills enhancement and career progression. 
However, we cannot ignore the concentration of low pay in the service sector and in rural communities which are dependent on seasonal tourism and agricultural work. The year of homecoming will be good for Scotland, but the Government has a duty to make sure that the benefits are shared across the workforce and spread across, across the country. The Scottish Government has to lead by example. It has not escaped my notice that a deal between PCS and the Business Arm of the National Museums of Scotland was only reached a few weeks ago, at last ensuring a living wage for those workers. Nor has it escaped the notice of this party or the trade union movement that the SNP has twice blocked Labour's progressive amendments to the Procurement Reform Bill, crucially including our living wage amendments. Presiding Officer, Visit Scotland have helpfully provided members with an overview of the activities taking place in our constituencies and regions this year. Tomorrow in Blantyre, the David Liven Museum will host a fair trade fair, highlighting Dr Livingston's legacy and his enduring links to Africa. This weekend there will be a celebration of our nature trails and our natural environment at the Wild Woods Festival. And on Saturday, we have flash art photography exhibitions in museums across North Lanarkshire. Later this year, we will see the Shots Highland Games, as said before, and the Rugby League Commonwealth Championships. And along in Central Scotland, we will also... Can I finish this first? And Central Scotland has also welcomed the completion of the Kelpies at the Helix Park in Falkirk. Stuart Stevenson. Uh, thank you very much. I wonder if the member would agree with me, and I suspect she can and will, uh, that all the points she's been saying are, are, are fine. We're now talking about events, of course, that are driven by and run by volunteers, and they play a very important part in energising communities and creating some of the events that will create commercial opportunities for others. So volunteers have a big role in this as well. Margaret McCulloch. Vol volunteers do play a part, but you've also got the hospitality and retail sector, which actually work with and welcome the visitors to Scotland as well. And it's those people that are actually working in this area that are working in low-paid environment. So on, um, I'll carry on. There is a rich programme of events taking place this year, but Visit Scotland explain in their briefing to members that many of those events are partner events and they're not directly supported by the three million homecoming fund. Obviously, we're only halfway through the year of homecoming, but I wonder if the Scottish Government are yet in a position to outline the value added to the Scottish economy through the projects it has funded directly. And finally, presiding officer, there has been a great deal of consensus in today's debate. We are all looking forward to Glasgow 2014 and we all want to make sure that the year of homecoming is good for Scotland and good for Scottish tourism. If I have to challenge that consensus this afternoon, then it is simply because I think it's worth reminding the government that growth in our co economy is asymmetrical. Whatever our constitutional fate, future, the challenge for Scotland is not just to develop these key sectors, but to build a stronger, fairer economy, better skilled, better paid and better equipped to become a world-leading destination. Thank you. Thank you very much. We still have a little bit of time in hand, um, so the next two speakers can certainly have longer than six minutes each. Annabel Ewing, to be followed by Dennis Robertson. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer, and I too am pleased to have been called to speak in this uh, debate this afternoon, which actually has uh, been a bit of a game of two halves because there have been some highly entertaining uh, moments. And I think when you first came in, Presiding Officer, you were a bit um, surprised at the, the moments of levity we were having, but that is nothing as compared to what you've missed, and I recommend reading the official report. But also we've had, uh, and I was a bit surprised at this, a bit of a rev I am jolly kind of theme going on, at least in the part of certain uh, Labour members who seem to be in competition, I think, with each other to be the most negative about our important tourism industry. In contrast, uh, presiding officer, uh, SNP members are, of course, full square behind uh, this uh, homecoming initiative, uh, as are all those involved in staging the events. I'll happily take uh, an intervention. From Jenny Mara. I thank the member for giving way. I'm actually quite... <laughs> appalled and shocked by the characterisation of my question, I asked a serious question based on figures issued by a government agency and the relation to the current political debate, which is a necessary function of parliamentary democracy. Um, 
does the member Order. does the member really want to characterise opposition and legitimate questioning as talking down Scotland? It seems quite preposterous. Annabel Ewing. Uh, thank you, presiding officer. Well, uh, in, a, in a kind of strange uh, day of strange remarks, I find that remark equally strange as the, the first remark. I think if the member reflects and looks at the tone of her comments in this debate, uh, when we get the official record, she'll see what we're all. Uh, getting at, uh, indeed, uh, matters of parliamentary democracy are fundamentally important, as is the de democratic debate that we are all engaged in throughout this uh, country of Scotland, that will be respected by all people across the world, including our fantastic friends and neighbours uh, south of the border, one of whom is coming up to help uh, me in the independence campaign, to campaign for a yes vote in the last week of the, uh, uh, of, uh, the, week of the polling. Uh, and so I'll pass on uh, your concern, Ms Mara's concerns to her that perhaps she should be reconsidering her uh, decision to come to help uh, the people of Scotland secure a, a yes vote in the independence referendum. But of course we are and the SNP full square behind this uh, homecoming uh, initiative, this excellent initiative and of course we take a positive approach, presiding officer, uh, in talking up our tourism industry and being supportive of it because that I believe is what people who elected us to this parliament want their elected representatives to do. Uh, as a member of uh, the Parliament for Mid-Scotland in Fife, the importance of tourism to the economy of the area is clear for all to see, and I would wish uh, uh, to take this opportunity uh, to add my welcome for the, indeed the excellent news as far as overseas tourism is concerned, that this increased by 10% last year with a 20% increased spend from the previous year. And I think these figures are particularly encouraging as we look at the homecoming initiative for this year. Uh, and indeed, I would say also that the figures reflect the very hard work put in by agencies such as Visit Scotland uh, and other public bodies, the Scottish Tourism Alliance, which has an important role to play, and of course the wider tourism industry. Uh, itself. And at uh, the outside of my substantive remarks on, on my uh, uh, activities happening in Miss Scotland in Fife, I think it would perhaps be expected of me to mention first the, the Ryder Cup. For as a resident of Strathairn with my home in Comrie, uh, what I am pleased to report uh, to the Chamber is that excitement is indeed mounting locally for what a tremendous opportunity this offers our local tourism and wider hospitality uh, providers across the Strath and indeed beyond. And I know that they are planning to maximise to the extent that they can the benefits to be derived uh, from this uh, fantastic event. And when I spoke uh, in the debate we had in this chamber last September, presiding officer, on the Ryder Cup, I did mention uh, the need to ensure that local access was facilitated, both in terms of those seeking to enjoy the events at Glen Eagles and in terms of travel around Strathairn generally. And I understand that the transport issues have been kept under regular review and that the provision of local shuttle buses has been agreed and that of course is very welcome and local dialogue is ongoing about that and other issues and that too is to be welcomed. Of course a key aspect of the fantastic opportunity uh, that uh, is the hosting of the Ryder Cup concerns the legacy that can be secured and the decision to nominate two local charities in this respect was also uh, welcomed uh, locally. The other key legacy aspect is the education resource to be available to all pupils and teachers in Scotland. And this is to be linked with the excellent uh, club golf uh, initiative. So whilst we have the Fantastic Rider Cup event later this year, the homecoming 2014 programme uh, seeks to ensure, of course, that the benefits of Scotland hosting this fantastic event uh, and others such as the Commonwealth Games, which will also be fantastic, can be extended and, and experienced and benefit uh, secured throughout Scotland. Uh, and in the huge array of projects that we see in Mid-Scotland and Fife, I think the programme runs to some 26 pages of events. Uh, uh, there's just perhaps time to mention uh, a few. And I think it, the first to mention would be the signature uh, uh, event that is the Fourth Bridges uh, Festival. And this event will celebrate the iconic Fourth Bridges and mark the 50th anniversary of the opening of the Fourth Road Bridge, as well as recognising the upcoming 125th anniversary of the Fourth Rail Bridge and looking, of course, to the future, to the new Fourth Crossing. It's to be held in early September with a 10-day programme of events, including a birthday boat flotilla. So what can be done on the West Coast, as my colleague Stuart McMillan mentioned, can also be done on the East Coast. There's a torchlight procession planned and a light and fireworks show, and I think it all sounds uh, very uh, exciting indeed. And we too, of course, in Mid-Scotland and Fife, uh, are participating 
uh, in the Whiskey Month, and we have seen the establishment in Highland Persia of the Highland Persia Whiskey Festival, which has brought together the Burnham Arts, the Burke Cinema, and Pitlochry Festival Theatre. Uh, to join together to put on a series of events around the theme of Whiskey Month, including a new production of the musical Whiskey uh, Kisses. We also see the Ochos Festival in June with walks, tours uh, uh, of historic kirkyards, uh, making reference to the point my colleague uh, Stuart Stevenson raised. We see Family Fun Days and the revival of the Tartan Ball, first held in the 1840s and intended at that time to inject some life into the local textile industry. So we see a diverse range of activities across Mid Scotland and Fife and I think we have to pay tribute to the tremendous hard work that goes on behind the scenes for each and every one of those interesting, dynamic, creative, inclusive and attractive events that will be taking place. One final remark, of course, we perhaps could do better in terms of overseas visitor numbers if we had control over, for example, air passenger duty. Because if we did have control over that in this Parliament, we wouldn't have it at such a sky-high rate as was uh, the case under the previous Labour government and uh, ratcheted up also by this Tory government, supported uh, by the Liberal helpers who haven't bothered to turn up to the important tourism uh, debate uh, today. But in conclusion, presiding officer, it is clear that that power and indeed all the other normal economic uh, levers of power that we will have with an independent Scotland uh, will help to boost our tourism industry and secure its full potential as indeed uh, uh, industries across uh, the piece. And I would suggest also that a vote, uh, that the referendum process itself together with a yes uh, vote delivered, which I will believe will be the case, will in and of themselves generate a substantial uh, uh, interest and increase in the tourism uh, spend and the tourism dividend for Scotland. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Many thanks. And I now call Dennis Robertson, after which we will move to closing speeches. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. And can I say that I'm grateful to the Presiding Officer for bringing to my attention that my, my button had gone off. Uh, this is probably due to an early intervention uh, of mine. Presiding Officer, the uh, Minister in his opening few sentences uh, mentioned the words opportunity and glue. And it's really with the opportunities of homecoming that, that does actually does provide the glue, I think, for many of the events that perhaps happen on an annual basis. You know, and I would probably gently say to Hans Isla Malik, whom I, I have a great deal of respect for, that just because something happens on an annual basis or, or it is going on in, 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 in your area, surely that, you know, if we can give it some oomph uh, in this year of 2014, then we should. So if Homecoming wants to actually take some credit uh, uh, for some of the events and Visit Scotland want to be the, the, the vehicle for doing that, then we should be applauding that, not criticising it. In my own area, uh, which hasn't been mentioned this afternoon, Presiding Officer, despite the fact that I think the borders have probably been mentioned at least 12 times now, that, um, that, that in, in my own area, in, in Aberdeenshire West, and I was actually surprised, presiding officer, that Alex Johnson didn't take the opportunity to mention aspects of what was going on w within the area. Um, the, the man that lives in Stonehaven in this year of 2014, the fireballs was once an amazing success in the Hogmanay parties in Stonehaven. But there are so many things going on within my own constituency of Aberdeenshire West. The home of 12 castles and indeed a royal palace. And it's perhaps to this royal palace that I go to because in some respects, a royal deeside sells itself. Does it need visit Scotland? Does it need a homecoming? Well, yes, it does. Although it can sell itself, it actually does actually benefit from this year of homecoming. Last year, when I was at the Ballater Highland Games, I was speaking to the clan chief, eh, Farkerson. And during that time, I met people from New Zealand. South Africa, Canada, East Kilbride. Um, I, I met people from all parts of the UK and Europe. And what, what intrigued me, presiding officer, at the time was, here was a clan gathering, a gathering of people, a homecoming within this small community of Royal Deeside in Ballater. And I'm sure 2014, again, we'll see the Farkasons clans coming back in greater numbers.
But of course, it's not just the Farkasons that have this uh, a, a association within my own constituency. We have the Irvins at Drum Castle, a castle that was gifted from Robert the Bruce to the Irvins at the time. And in this year, we'll be having the reopening of the Tower at Drum in August of this year. And this is, again, a fantastic event that will bring together our communities, our communities in celebration of our heritage and our culture. And this is what we've got an opportunity to celebrate, heritage and culture. It's about peoples coming together from all over. And that invite will bring people, not just from the UK and Europe and global, it will, bring, it will, just, it will just excite people, excite people to what is happening and can I take this opportunity, presiding officer, to hope that the sun shines on Siobhan McMahon's 30th birthday? Because there seems to be a black cloud looming over the Labour Party at the moment. And I sincerely hope that cloud doesn't burst and rain on her parade on that day. But, presiding officer, I have three distilleries within my own constituency. And I have been to all three. But in this year of 2014, I hope to celebrate again uh, revisiting the three. But the Royal Loch Nagar at Bramar is perhaps the best known in my own constituency. A favourite of Prince Charles. A favourite of Prince Charles who likes his Nagar, uh, Royal uh, Loch Nagar whisky. And he himself has visited that distillery on more than one occasion. And I sincerely hope that the, the Royals will continue to, to come to Royal D side. And to, and to remain part of the culture and the, the heritage of, of that uh, great place. It was actually Queen Victoria who gifted uh, Balmoral Castle in 1850, I believe, uh, for Prince Albert at the time, uh, when she'd actually come to her first Highland Games in 1848. But going round my constituency... What else is going on, presiding officer? Well, up in our small market town of Huntley in August and late August, we've got a fantastic massing of the pipes and drums. Again, celebrating the clan Gordon. Again, one of our wonderful traditional clans of Scotland. The Gordons is probably known globally, not just for um, the, the name the Gordon, but for their fighting spirit. And we have, we have that, as I say, the, the, the opportunity to, to enjoy that uh, Pike Fest. Uh, I, I sincerely hope um, that the Pike Fest, in the, uh, just prior to the, the celebrations at Bannockburn, goes extremely well. Uh, but I would encourage uh, my, my friend and colleague, Bruce Crawford, that if he wants to hear the real pipes and drums of Scotland uh, 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 and the tunes of our nation... Come to Huntley. Come to Huntley. That is the place to come to, Mr. Crawford. <laughs> come to. Uh, can I say that uh, the, the minister has been in my own constituency many times and, and visited many of the traditional areas. And it is a, a, it's a wealth of food and drink in my own area. And the industry in terms of the fishing in the Royal D side is worth, oh, about I think it was about 15 million last year in terms of what it brings to that local community. And it provides jobs for about 500 people uh, within the community. So our estates provide employment. They provide sustainability. But they provide an open door, provide, uh, presiding officer. And that is what we should be celebrating in our homecoming. An open door. An open door to all. To everyone who wishes to come to Scotland. Presiding officer... I'm proud of Scotland. I'm proud to be an Aberdonian. I'm proud that I've had the opportunity to travel and be part of this, this great nation and work in many different areas. And when I heard Stuart McMillan talking about the events in the Clyde, it took me back to my many sailing days in the Clyde. And, you know, and, and it's just a, a wonderful place to be. And, and I have spent many a time in the borders, again, in Melrose, Jedburgh, in my scouting days, camping and going to hostels. Again, an open door. And it's not just about, you know, the, 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 the homecoming, the big events, the Commonwealth Games, the Ryder Cup. This year we have the Scottish uh, Golf Open in Royal Aberdeen. That will generate income for Aberdeen and the surrounding areas. 
We have the refurbishment of the Aberdeen Airport. Again, why is it happening, presiding officer? It's because people are coming to Scotland. We've had to invest. We've had to, we've had to expand. And that is, that is what the open door for Scotland is about. Absolutely. Christine Graham, it's delightful though it is. I would like to ask, it's quite a serious question actually, if you've ever had trouble accessing any of these places. I really am asking this on behalf of Mr Q. Dennis Robertson, if you could begin to draw to a close, please. <laughs> uh, thank you, presiding officer. I have had absolutely no difficulty accessing uh, many of our wonderful herit uh, heritage uh, uh, hostels and heritable sites uh, within Scotland. And I know there are some places, but can I say that you know, with, with, with the work of Visit Scotland and NTS and everything, everything has been done to try and make uh, venues accessible. And the Commonwealth Games, I think, is going to be a wonderful example, presiding officer, of full accessibility for everyone, regardless of their, if they're able or, or disabled. And can I just say, in conclusion, presiding officer, Scotland is the place to come in 2014. Thank you. Many thanks. Uh, we now turn to the closing speeches and I call on Liz Smith with around eight minutes, please. Uh, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. Uh, perhaps not surprisingly, uh, there are several members in the Chamber this afternoon who have cited 2014 as the uh, most important year in Scotland's history. And that's not just because of the constitutional issue. Indeed, I don't really think this debate is about whether you're voting no or voting yes, because for me, it is a privilege, a real privilege, uh, to be Scottish in this year. Uh, and uh, the fact that the Commonwealth Games and the Ryder Cup are both coming to Scotland uh, is something that I think we can all rejoice in, irrespective of how we uh, vote when it comes to party politics. And I think the fact that they can... They can mix uh, with uh, our long-standing fixtures uh, across the calendar uh, is very special. And uh, uh, Dennis Robertson has just encouraged us all to say something about our local uh, community. So can I add the Perth show uh, to that um, list? Because I think the Perth show has done something very special for a very long period of time. And I know that they too are looking forward to this second year of homecoming. Because it does present an opportunity to highlight the very many diverse events which do take place across the nation uh, on an annual basis and which add to what I think is a very considerable uh, privilege in terms of our cultural, sporting, artistic, agricultural, environmental and our hospitality, which is so uh, special in Scotland. Uh, but of course, the fact that we have this additional added value this year uh, is uh, really something that we should celebrate. So it's no problem, I don't think, uh, to be positive uh, about this year. Uh, and uh, I welcome the comments that Dennis Robertson uh, made in the uh, opening remarks uh, about uh, the royal family, uh, because I think that is something, again, that transcends uh, party political uh, differences. And as a result, of course, the uh, potential benefits to the Scottish uh, economy are so significant in the way that many members uh, have described. Uh, Annabel Ewing, in her contribution, mentioned uh, the excitement building about the Ryder Cup, um, I think that's something that is due to bring in somewhere in the region of £100 million as visitors flock across uh, from all parts of the globe uh, to Scotland to experience uh, golf on one of the best courses in the world. And it's estimated that that competition will be viewed by hundreds of millions of potential visitors worldwide as they watch the television. And therefore, it cannot but be one of the best advertising uh, opportunities uh, for Scotland and let's hope that the Scottish weather uh, presents Scotland at its best, not like the uh, 38th Ryder Cup which was held at Celtic Manor. Of course, Stuart Mr. Stevenson. Um, is the member aware that paradoxically there are tourists come from the Middle East precisely because of the lush, damp climate that we have in Scotland? Liz Smith. And dare I ask Mr Stevenson if the surname is the same as your own? <laughs> Now, Presiding Officer, Homecoming has presented a very welcome umbrella to showcase the vast programme of over 800 events which are uh, taking place the length and breadth uh, of Scotland. And two members have made very important remarks about the uh, welcome profile for the more rural and uh, more uh, uh, local economies as well as the uh, national profile because uh, we must not forget about these because they are the heart and soul of many of our local communities 
uh, as are the volunteers of Mr Stevenson. I think you mentioned to the volunteers uh, who are part of the imagination and the creativity uh, that they provide. And let's be clear that that is the main criteria uh, by which the uh, uh, year of homecoming will probably be judged by many people uh, is how many it does attract from out with uh, the United Kingdom, whether or not they share the name uh, Stevenson or not. It is an issue uh, that will, uh, I'm sure, uh, be of great interest to people who decide uh, whether it has been a success or not. Uh, Bruce Crawford mentioned quite rightly the absolutely outstanding uh, new facilities at Bannockburn, which I think would uh, be on a par with anything across the world. They are absolutely outstanding. Uh, and I'm sure that the uh, Bannockburn Live event, uh, which will incorporate that uh, in reenactment of the battle, will promise to bring in large numbers. It may not be quite the numbers that were originally anticipated, but let's be sure that we can celebrate everything that is so very special about that new centre. Now, one of the areas uh, I wanted to touch upon uh, in the uh, comments, I think um, both the Minister and Siobhan McMahon uh, talked about tourism in general, uh, and that is extremely important. And if I have just one little criticism, uh, and I don't want to be shouted down for being party political about this, because it's not, but could I just mention one thing, uh, Minister, because I know you have uh, an interest in this. You've kindly replied uh, to me on uh, two occasions on this about... Uh, the issue of the tourist information centres because they are something that I think we are in danger of losing in uh, quite a number of places. And I know there are technological reasons for that and you've quite rightly said that consumer uh, demand is changing in that uh, respect and, uh, and I can uh, accept that. But I think I, I do worry and I'm sure Annabel Ewing will share the views that I have when we see uh, areas like Creef losing their uh, tourist information centre at the very time where they... Um, business uh, improvement district uh, policy, which is very much a Scottish government one, is taking place. Um, many businesses and people who run hotels and bed and breakfasts in the area are concerned about what the long term is for that. And I think we have lessons that perhaps can be learned from uh, countries like Switzerland uh, and Austria, who could not be more modern when it comes to their technology, but they have also been able to uh, retain their tourist information offices and the human touch, which I believe uh, is so much part of the uh, Scottish uh, welcome. And I think we have to be careful that we don't, as I say, uh, lose too many of these tourist information uh, centres. Now, I fully appreciate that there are issues about economies of scale that can result from tourist hubs in our more urban areas. Uh, but I think we do have to listen to many uh, who are talking uh, about the business development that they can foresee, uh, particularly outside uh, the central belt, uh, who very much welcome the input that can come from these uh, tourist information centres. So I hope, Minister, uh, in your closing remarks, you could just say something a little bit about that, because I think it's something that we have to uh, take uh, for uh, a careful look in the future. So to conclude, uh, Deputy Presiding Officer, can I go back to my uh, original remarks about the positivity that we need to show uh, in terms of this uh, year. It is a very, very special year uh, for Scotland. Politics aside, uh, I think we could all be positive about that uh, message. I think we all have a role to play in helping our own uh, local communities uh, and, of course, the national profile uh, to develop. And I hope politics does not get in the way of that because I think that diminishes Scotland when it does. Uh, we should celebrate uh, as a nation what we have to offer. Uh, so we're very happy to support the government motion and also uh, the Labour amendment. Many thanks. And I now call on Jenny Mara. Ten minutes, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Um, I think this has been a largely uh, good debate, and I think there is a lot of goodwill and optimism around 2014, the year of homecoming, the homecoming events, the Ryder Cup, the Commonwealth Games. And we all want to see Scotland flourish on the international stage, and we all know how wonderful our country is as a place to visit, to live and to work in. But I believe that this homecoming and the events this year can be about so much more than simply putting on a show. Our investment can draw dividends in our communities and that's why our amendment is down uh, this afternoon and I thank uh, the Conservatives for indicating that they are happy to support the amendment. The investment can help our economy recover. 
with a long-term boost to a sector that has a potential to boom exponentially. But in order to achieve this, we have to be smart about the policies we pursue. And my only disappointment in this afternoon's debate is that we have not been a bit more focused on uh, strategic um, investment about how we grow our, our tourism economy and the policies that we pursue to do that. I understand that it's a debate to, to celebrate the homecoming um, the events in Scotland, but I think we really need and have a responsibility to take every opportunity in this chamber to, to, to look at these events as potential growth for the future and share ideas about how we increase employment and grow our economy and grow business. Um, as a result of these, because we need to be smart about the policies uh, we pursue and we have to make sure that all events taking place, especially uh, major events such as the Commonwealth Games, are delivered successfully. That is in everyone's interests. Yes. Annabelle Ewing. Grateful for the members taking intervention. The member was talking about uh, you know, being smart and taking responsibility and you know, boosting tourism and using everything we have at our disposal. Does the member share my disappointment, therefore, that in the recent Labour uh, sort of uh, offer, if you like, for the referendum in terms of increased powers for this Parliament, the devolution of air passenger duty was not one of the things that Labour felt this Parliament should have power over? Jenny Mada. No, it wasn't in the uh, devolution Commission document because we think it is one of the things that actually is better is better shared risk and responsibility with the rest of the United Kingdom. You know, I would take the opportunity to say to Annabel Ewing and the, the rest of the chamber at this point, I, you know, I may be small, but I'm one of the biggest patriots in this chamber. And I have always and I have Order, please. If the member would let Order. me if the member would let me finish this point. I have always felt that actually our place as a nation within a larger uh, union, political and social, is a very mature and a very constructive place to be. I am happy to celebrate and to, uh, to shout for Scotland at every opportunity within that very sensible political and economic structure. And that is the, uh, that is the position on which I approach this debate. And I would like to turn, if the member will allow me, to some of the systemic issues I think can grow our industry. And I'm happy to take another intervention from her if she wishes. Annabel Ewing. I'm most grateful uh, uh, because uh, I hear what the member says, but uh, none of it really related to my question which was, you know, if, if the member is so in favour of boosting the Scottish tourism industry, why is she not in favour of this parliament controlling air passenger duty? Because obviously we would seek to take away the skyrocketing uh, rates uh, that are uh, stimming our tourism industry. Jenny Mara. Simply because I believe it is a policy that is better shared with the rest of the United Kingdom and that there's parity in that policy across mm -hmm. these islands. I hope that's clear enough. I hope that's clear enough for her. I'll take one last intervention on this point. Stuart Maxwell. Can I thank the member for taking the intervention. And I heard what she said about the fact that APD, in her view, should not be devolved to this parliament because it should be done in a, as a single unified uh, uh, policy across the UK. Why is it the case then that uh, APD is devolved to Northern Ireland? Jenny Mara. Yeah. Annabelle Ewing asked me what was in the devolution commission proposals. I cl clarified that for her. Um, we, can, we can discuss air passenger duty and proposals and all these things another time and perhaps after the result on the 18th of, of September. I'd like to return, if I may, to the strategic issues around the tourism industry and homecoming. Because we, have, we know that the uh, rate of youth employment in Scotland is persistently around 22%, and this is a problem that is shared with, with England and with other economies in the EU. And it's something I think all of us in this chamber would agree is far too high. And I think tackling youth unemployment should be at the heart of every economic policy and event that this government pursues. And the Commonwealth Games are no different. You know, we have heard today of the surge in visitors to Scotland for these games and the potential that brings to boost our services, hospitality and logistics sector in Scotland. Yet, I am concerned that when it comes to securing that advantage for our young people through employment and apprenticeships that we haven't done enough. The Skills Investment Plan details key levers 
like modern apprenticeships that can be used to link young people into the tourist sector and help fill the skills gap that some employers perceive there to be. Yet I am hearing from providers that Skills Development Scotland is reducing funding in these areas in a move that seems to directly undermine their own ambition and what would appear to be a good opportunity to get young people into jobs. And I would reiterate my call in my opening speech for the Minister to address this specific point in his closing uh, remarks this afternoon. Presiding officer, if I may turn to some points that have been raised in the debate, I think my colleagues Siobhan McMahon and Margaret McCulloch um, echoed my own priorities uh, for, for this topic, talking about the higher levels of uh, modern apprenticeships, um, also addressing female employment and how in the hospitality sector uh, female employment is you know the predominant employment and the challenges facing some of these workers low wages I think the living wage um, would be something that a lot of these workers would welcome and also the issue of uh, zero hours contracts um, I hope that is also something that is live in this debate because I think our hospitality sector in Scotland must aspire to excellence across the board. And we have some wonderful examples in Scotland of um, most outstanding hotels and service. But I would like to see the Scottish tourist industry aspire to these standards right across the board in budget and mid-sector accommodation also. In a recent meeting with Highlands and Islands Enterprise, I, uh, I, put to, I put to the Chief Executive that actually in the Highlands there are many, many um, very, very good five-star and high-budget, high-end uh, accommodation and hospitality offers in the Highlands, but not so many budget and mid and mid um, mid budget options. And that may be one of the reasons, actually, that what that some of these um, internal UK uh, tourism uh, figures are not quite as good as we would like. Yes, I'm happy to. Am I okay for time, President? Stuart Stevenson. Um, I, I just wonder if the member is uh, doing down some of the um, entry-level uh, attractions that are. I think of going to the West Coast and always stopping at the Green Welly uh, Cafe at Tindrum, for example, which is a bus party cafe and yet aspires to the highest of standards with excellent staff and supporting people. Jenny Mara. Absolutely, and I have been a frequent visitor to the Green Welly shop and cafe on my hill walking expeditions up north. I am not doing down anyone or anything. I am merely suggesting that if we are to, to boost the economy in the way that Deloitte and Barclays have predicted, a 40%, that actually we must aspire to the highest standards to give all budgets across, um, across the sector good accommodation, the highest service, and we will attract more and more tourism. I think that is a perfectly plain point, and I hope the member will understand that I'm not doing down anyone. I also think we must look at transport links within our country. It was a campaign I pursued recently on uh, fares um, into Dundee because we have the, the v &A attraction that will open over the next few years but uh, rail fares into the city were, were very high and Alex Salmond came in and managed to sort out a bit of that, not all of that but I think we really need to look at integrating our, you know, our, our fare structure and look carefully at the price of travelling within Scotland because internal tourism is also within Scotland and I'm sure any member of this chamber who has been lucky enough like I to visit other countries like Italy will know that it is far cheaper to, to get around the country on, on bus and train than it is in Scotland. And if we're serious about domestic tourism, we need to address this as well. I'd like to make um, a couple of, of, of final points on these events. I think the homecoming event and the, the gathering and, and all of these things are very valid. I have to say, presiding officer, in my own experience, some of the excellent sporting events we put on, participatory sporting events for people in Scotland, are some of the most simple but effective ways of boosting our economy. I was up, um, not participating, but I was up at the Loch Ness Tap uh, a couple of weekends ago, and the simplicity of that event, but its drive to bring 
people um, spending into the into the community in Inverness, in the restaurants, in the hotels, you know, is plain for all to see. And encouraging that kind of sporting ethos right across our country is good for the health of our nation as well as the tourism sector. And I'd I would be grateful if you could now draw to conclusion. Okay, thank you, President Officer. Can I can I finally say I think this has been a constructive debate. I think we need to think more about some of the strategic issues in employment and an excellence in our hospitality industry. Um, but I think it's been um, a very good debate and I would move the amendment in my name. Thank you. Many thanks. And I now call on Fergus Ewing to wind up the debate. Minister, you have until five o'clock. Uh, officer, um, this has been a debate uh, not entirely without uh, revelations. We were very pleased to be able to congratulate all of us, Siobhan McMahon, on her impending 30th birthday. Um, we also learned that Christine Graham and Bruce Crawford have agreed in this chamber an impromptu sort of double date, which I do hope they both enjoy. It, it, uh, it certainly won't be boring. Uh, we learned that Stuart Stevenson has no less than 500 relatives spread across Canada and the USA, and that there are 3,465 Stevensons across the world, which leads me to wonder whether I should ask uh, Visit Scotland to concentrate a specific marketing effort <laughs> on the, the world gathering of Stevensons. And sadly, this is matched by uh, an alarming um, uh, insufficiency of biages. Perhaps a, a few more biages might be a counterweight to perhaps the surfeit of Stevensons, one, one might think. And we're also pleased to learn, I was pleased to learn, that Jenny Mara has visited uh, Loch Ness at the ETAP. I hope she was able to sight, have a sighting of the Loch Ness monster, Nessie. And I will make only one reference to the referendum in this closing speech this afternoon, uh, presiding officer. Uh, that is that I know uh, entirely about the voting intentions of Nessie in the referendum, because Nessie is, of course, a floating voter. <laughs> so with that uh, controversial moment aside, um, I think, to be fair, I would like to address some of the serious comments made, because whereas I think most of our remarks will be designed to address the homecoming and celebrate, promote the homecoming, as I think most members have done, nonetheless, uh, a number of important issues have been raised, and I want to try to just briefly address all of them. And, of course, if I fail to do so in a comprehensive manner, then, then obviously I, I'm happy to write to members, as, as is my universal practice in these cases. Mr. Malik did ask what uh, efforts we have made to ensure that we reach out in this homecoming year to minority communities in Scotland. And, and I, I'm, uh, Fiona, Fiona Hislop has once again uh, come to listen to the, the, the closing sections of the debate. And I know that she has made sterling efforts in working with the black and ethnic minority communities to develop a whole series of events. We've had the uh, Edinburgh Mila as part of Homecoming Scotland. Glasgow Mila, Culture and Cocktails, a pop-up event celebrating African black communities in Aberdeen. Refugee Week Scot Scotland taking place next month, a week-long festival of arts, culture, sport and heritage that celebrates the contributions that refugees make to Scotland. So I'm proud that my colleague Fiona Hislop and others have been arranging these events. I think we all are because how can we welcome others if we don't welcome those within Scotland who are taking refuge from other countries? So, so uh, well, certainly I'll take an intervention. Hans Alamalik. Uh, thank you very much. I, I genuinely appreciate this opportunity. All I wanted to say was, and I did remark in my speech, and that was that there are so many activities that take place anyway out with coming, coming home 2014. And you need to bear with me because... The point that I'm trying to make, and I've, I've obviously failed to make, and that was that when we engage with the visible minority communities, I don't wish us to just engage with them at the mela or at the local functions where they, they get together and they have a dance and have pakoras and go home. I actually want them to engage with our cousins overseas in America and New Zealand and Canada and various other places. That's not happening. That's missing. And that's what I'm make, making my point. My point is that getting together with people who are from minority communities, with minority communities, is one goal, but mixing with the host indigenous community and our cousins from overseas is another field altogether. And the other point I was making was... I must hurry you along, please. There, there, are, there are aspirations from the community in terms of employment and opportunities, which is missing. It's not happening. Minister. 
Well, I was seeking to address the remarks that Mr Malik made in his opening speech, which I did think were of a slightly negative flavour, because there have been a lot of efforts done. Now, of course, we all recognise, presiding officer, we want to do more. I mean, which one of us as an MSP doesn't think we should do more for Scotland? Of course we do. Uh, but I think that there has been a lot done and, and additional events, uh, which I don't have the time to read out, actually, because there's too many of them. But just let me say that just recently, uh, Fiona Hislop launched... Uh, the Multicultural Homecoming Programme at Glasgow University. So, you know, I, I think we have uh, sought to do good things, and of course we want to do more. With regarding the second point Mr Malik makes about uh, events and the claiming credit for efforts of others, um, of course part of homecoming is to put a brand on Scotland, to, to make uh, Scotland exciting and appealing to other countries in the world to make us a go-to place. And that, actually, presiding officer, is precisely why CNN voted that Scotland was the top country in the world to visit. Because when I heard that, and it was uh, the beginning of last year, actually, I thought, why? What was their reasoning? That's what particularly interested me, apart from the accolade itself, which was marvelous. So I got hold of the press release. And what they said was this. They said, that in making this uh, decision that Scotland is the best country in the world to visit, we take into account the excellent marketing of Visit Scotland, in particular the branding of the themed years uh, and branding events with that imprimatur adds to the attraction. Well, just let me finish, and I'll certainly, once I've dealt with the, the previous point, I wanted to say that the, the credit for running existing events, of course, goes to those who run the existing events. And personally, you know, I agree with Ronald Reagan when he said this. He said, it's amazing what you can achieve if you don't really mind who gets the credit. Alec Johnson. Alec Johnson. I was simply going to ask that, uh, given the decision by CNN to promote Scotland in that way, could it be the case that there are Stevensons on the staff there? Minister. I would think it was unlikely that there is an absence of Stevensons. <laughs> Um, Presiding officer, I wanted to talk about the, the point that Jenny Mara raised about the, uh, the, reduction, the slight reduction in the number of uh, domestic visitors to Scotland from south of the border. Um, the, the position is complex, and I don't have time to go into all of the aspects here. But first of all, as Ms Mara will recall, I said in my opening statements that the latest figures for 2013 showed that residents in England took 10% more short breaks in Scotland than 2012, and that there was a 4% increase between 2012 and 2013 in residents in England taking longer holidays in Scotland. Now, those comparisons are over a whole year, and I think it is reasonable to say that if you pick one particular quarter, then you're perhaps likely to get a less complete picture than if you measure things over a longer period. However, Mr. Stevenson's point was also correct, namely that Whereas there has been a reduction in domestic tourists in Scotland, so there has been a counterpart reduction, it would appear, south of the border, broadly speaking, taking everything into account. So I think to ascribe a sort of political motivation to this is unfortunate, because there doesn't seem to me to be any evidential basis to it. Uh, and I was struck by the, the contrasting tone, I think, if it's fair to say, of Elizabeth Smith's uh, closing remarks, which I think really caught the mood of the debate, to be fair to her. All of us want to see homecoming succeed, uh, as it surely will. Uh, and we do not see it as in any way a political event, a matter of politics. All of us have different views and can respect the views of those with whom we disagree. So we, all of us can work towards making homecoming 214 a great success. Uh, and therefore, I entirely endorse Elizabeth Smith's remarks regarding the visitor information centres, the tourist information centres, uh, of course, I have engaged with her closely on this and on other members. Uh, and these visitor information centres provide an enormously useful role from the public. The way in which they offer that service is changing. I have opened, for example, offices in Peebles and St Andrews and other places where a, they have a combined with local authorities or combined with uh, commercial players in order to improve their offering. Uh, but these are very important matters, and I, I just stress that to her. I'm interested in getting every decision right, and they are not easy ones to make, as she will know. I didn't want to neglect that point since she 
fairly raised it. The skills issue is extremely important, and uh, of course we must use the funding that we have to best effect. That's why I'm delighted that Skills Development Scotland is now enabling the East Lothian Tourism and Hospitality Academy initiative, which was highlighted, presiding officer, in this parliament uh, at a reception, and which has been enormously successful uh, to be rolled out throughout Scotland. And of course, organisations such as Springboard, uh, competitions such as uh, uh, Junior Chef, uh, training uh, at a, a different level in respect of the Strathclyde University and globally prestigious Hotel University course, also offered at Lausanne, Switzerland, also make an enormous contribution to the common wheel. Um, in the debate, presiding officer, we have, uh, we have heard much about the contribution that the clans make. Uh, and I mentioned earlier on, I was delighted that Sir Malcolm McGregor and John McKenzie are here. And let me say that sometimes governments should say that we, we need to do things better. And one such occasion was uh, some time ago when I realised that the relationship that we enjoyed with the clans was not as good as it should be. And I realised that in the hospitality of Castle Loud with John McKenzie. And what I did was to set about improving it. And I think with respect, we have uh, achieved a measure of success. We have set up a clan fund with financial support of up to £5,000. Uh, ten uh, events are receiving support from that fund. And perhaps more important than those, those particular relatively small financial contributions are the fact that we have a clan forum which was established to ensure close working between the Scottish Government, Visit Scotland and Scotland's clans and families. And I wanted to make particular reference to the fact that uh, I believe that the contribution that clans make to the common weal in Scotland, to tourism, to bringing back people from all over the world, not just in one year, but in every year, and to do so on a regular basis, is something that I'm proud to be associated with. And proud because at the essence of the celebration of the clan history of Scotland is the fact that we are celebrating friendship and connection with people from other countries. So, in conclusion, uh, presiding officer, as Marco Biaggi rightly said, let 2014 be the year when all of us pull on the blue jersey for Scotland. As Dennis Robertson said, let 2014 be the year where Scotland has had an open door to welcome everybody from the world. And let 2014, the year of homecoming, be the year where it's Scotland's Cayley, everyone is welcome. Thank you, Minister. That concludes the debate on Homecoming Scotland 2004. There are two questions to be put as a result of today's business. The first question is Amendment No. 10051.1 in the name of Jenny Mara, which seeks to amend Motion No. 10051 in the name of Fergus Ewing on Homecoming Scotland 2014 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? The amendment is therefore agreed to. The next question is that motion number 10051 in the name of Fergus Ewing as amended on Homecoming Scotland 2014 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? The motion as amended is therefore agreed to. That concludes decision time. I now close this meeting.